Okay, Chair. Great, thank you. Good evening, I am calling this public hearing to order at 6.05 p.m. in accordance with the Massachusetts Wetland Protection Act, MGLC um, 131, Section 40 in the Boston Wetlands Ordinance, Boston City Code Ordinances, Chapter 7-1.4. The Boston Conservation Commission is holding this public hearing on April 5th, 2023, to review the following projects to determine what conditions, if any, the commission will impose in order to protect the interests of the public and private water supply, groundwater, prevention of pollution, flood control, prevention of storm damage, protection of fisheries and land containing shellfish, and protection of wildlife habitat. This evening's hearing um, will be followed by a regular meeting in accordance with chapter 107 of the acts of 2022. We are conducting this meeting online to ensure public access to the deliberations of the Conservation Commission. The public may access this call through telephone and video conferencing. Additionally, the meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to be recorded, please turn off your video. Members of the public may have an opportunity to ask questions and provide public comment on applications and discussions. To do so, please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccaboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Enviro and using the hashtag ConCom hearing. Um, for the record, I am Michael Parker, Chair of the Commission. I'll call the role of um, uh, staff and commissioners. Who's here for staff this evening? Allison Brizius, Environment Department. Elena Itamary, Environment Department. Christopher Edwards, Environment Department. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan? John Sullivan. Commissioner Long? Present. Commissioner Conan? Conan Thurwing, I'm here, Chair Parker. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Herbst? Ann Herbst. Fantastic. Okay, uh, because of quorum issues this evening, we're going to shuffle the agenda around a little bit. So the first item that we'll be hearing is notice of intent for DEP file number 0061919 and Boston file number 2023-013. Um, for this matter, uh, because uh, someone in my firm represents the uh, proponent um, I'm going to need to recuse myself, so I would entertain a motion to appoint Commissioner Herbst as acting chair for this hearing. So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I enthusiastically vote aye. Thank you. Uh, and who do we have here to present for the applicant? Good evening, Matt Morrow, along with uh, John Grenier, representing the applicant. Okay, just a reminder that this is a continued hearing, so just you you can provide us with updates from the last meeting. That would be great. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, the commission asked for a couple of items uh, from the last meeting. One was the Boston Water and Sewer Approval. Um, that is currently underway. Application has been made. Um, to my knowledge, I have not received any indication that they have responded yet. Um, the second item was the uh, proposed wall. The commission expressed the desire to see it removed from the riverfront. And I don't know if the um, if you're able to show the revised plan that I had on the PowerPoint presentation. That looks like yeah. Okay. So essentially what we have done here is we've moved the wall out five feet. It is now out of the riverfront. It is still within waterfront, but out of the riverfront. And what we've done is we've expanded our original proposed restoration area was a little over 400 square feet. It's like 428, I believe. What we're doing now is we've expanded that restoration area to 1,023 square feet. We will use a meadow, uh, a meadow mix planting that should blend in quite well with the area um, that the commission reviewed with me at the last meeting, along with a staggered planting of elderberry and um, winterberry bushes. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, Allison, any comments from you on this item? No additional comments. Okay, uh, before I go to commissioners, uh, as a reminder to members of the public to provide public comment, please raise your hand or, uh, whoops, some, some of that. 
or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email, email at cc at boston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Enviro and using the hashtag uh, concom hearing. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan, uh, any comments from you? Yeah, real quick on Matt, uh, did the plans you have at the water and sewer reflect the moving of the wall, et cetera? Uh, I do believe so. they do. Yes. yes, these these most recent plans are what was what was uh, put into Boston Water and Sewer. Okay, that, just curious. Yeah, there's a little bit of a backlog getting those things done, but any order of conditions can be subject to Water and Sewer signing off, so that shouldn't be an issue. That's all I had. Yeah. Okay, uh, Commissioner Long. No further questions. Uh, Commissioner Connor. Is there an existing wall? Yes, there is. And so so we're taking that existing wall out and moving it up five feet. Okay. So that still is activity, but it's the activity I understand you're saying you can't help. Right. I mean, essentially, the, the overall impact would be zero. If anything, we'd be adding habitat um, to basically close off that section of the riverfront. And I know the commission has some restorative work going on in the lot behind me that actually should blend in quite well with it. Thank you. No further questions, Chair. Okay. Um, I don't have further questions either. I'll just note that I, I, I appreciate the moving the wall. That was, uh, I think, is an improvement. And I actually was on site yesterday, I think, to, to view the stone wall that's going to be moved, uh, Commissioner Conan. And it, it's actually very, um, it's, it, it will be minimally invasive. You, you wouldn't do this, but you could almost move it by hand. It's, it's just stones that can be moved. Uh, I see. That so I, 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 I don't have any uh, additional issues. Um, we did have a conversation about, there's a lot of vines growing up on the trees that that's some restoration that could be done in, in that area as well. Um, are there any questions? Uh, any, has anybody raised their hand, Allison? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Checking nothing on Twitter and no additional comments in the email. So no. Okay. And were there any issues with the special conditions? Um, not that I'm not aware of. Okay. Yeah, not on my end. Were there okay. any on the, <laughs> on the representatives? Looked like we got a nod, but it was okay. Uh, no, I, I understand the only special condition would be. Um, you know, obviously subject to us getting our approvals through Boston Water and Sewer, which are yeah. under. Okay. Yeah, that would be part yeah, of that's Okay. I, I think then at this point, uh, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Conan? Aye. And I vote aye. So that's four to nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your time. I'll be happy to turn it over to our chair. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Herbst. Okay, next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number 0061929 and Boston file number 2023-019 from LEC Environmental Consultants, Inc. on behalf of the Boston Parks and Recreation Department for the proposed implementation of phase two site improvements at Sharing Woods Urban Wild located at 1 Marston Street in Hyde Park. Resource area is 100 foot buffer to BVW. Um, I'll note Commissioner Long, uh, I believe you have to recuse yourself as you're an employee of um, Parks and Rec, correct? Yes, for the record, I'm recusing myself. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, who's here on behalf of the proponent? Hi, it's Andrea Kendall from LAC. Can you hear me okay? I can. Great, perfect. Uh, thanks for the time tonight. Um, been working with uh, Paul Sutton from the Boston Parks and Recreational Department, um, along with Hatch, uh, the landscape architect um, who put together the plans. This project is implementation of phase two site improvements uh, within the Sharon Woods Urban uh, Wild property uh, within the Hyde Park neighborhood. Um, 
the locus on the right shows the entire parcel. Uh, phase one site improvements occurred um, in 2018 within the southern portion of the site. And this current phase uh, is within the northwest portion of the site adjacent to Sharon Street. Uh, generally, it includes um, buffer zone restoration measures as well as stormwater uh, improvements and enhancements. Um, within this portion of the site, there's a number of uh, construction debris, uh, impervious surface, trash, yard waste, et cetera, that will be cleaned up. And as is typical in um, many places today, there's a number of, uh, of invasive species. Uh, so that will uh, be addressed as part of this project and then associated uh, native plantings. Um, and then if we can just go on to the next site, next slide, I'll show you. Um, generally, this is um, the north is to the right, south is to the left, um, and then this is the really subset of the of the project area. Um, next slide, please. So this is the existing conditions of the site. The area um, to the plan south is the uh, bordering vegetated wetland. There's the 100 uh, foot buffer zone off of that. Uh, the light blue area is the current stormwater feature. And that little red line is where there's a drainage outfall um, that, that receives street drainage um, from Sharon Street through uh, a, two or three catch basins there. Um, just a point of, of reference, this drainage outfall and uh, construction of Sharon Street was, uh, and then construction of the stormwater feature was done through an order of conditions issued back in 2000 uh, for a private, um, I guess, developer who, who uh, constructed the street and I guess did some other, other improvements. Um, that uh, stormwater feature was was uh, was I guess uh, approved for uh, was located in an area that was identified as an isolated wetland, um, but with the existing order of conditions, and it was at a time when the commission didn't have their um, uh, their ordinance, which protected IVWs, um, you know, there, there's an existing order of conditions that allowed the conversion of this feature to function um, to treat stormwater. So um, to the left, uh, plan left uh, by this existing trail, um, there's, a, there's a number of uh, in, uh, roadway millings and other debris that effectively, and a bunch of invasive species that have, are growing within this corridor that's the subject of this, um, of this proposal. So next slide, please. Effectively, there are three areas of, of the project. Um, the trailhead area is where that uh, milling is. So uh, that will be removed. Um, the area, uh, healthy new soil uh, brought in, the area regraded to generally mimic what's out there today uh, and, and reseeded and, and replanted with a host of native species. Um, along the Sharon Street uh, shoulder, similarly, there's been accumulation of debris throughout the years. So that will be removed and slightly regraded. Um, and then within the um, stormwater feature, also um, with invasive species, that area will be slightly regraded and, um, and invasive species managed and, and a host of, of new planting suitable for that setting, um, wetland setting will be installed. There will be a new guardrail along that steep slope. Next, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the proposed regrading um, and the new guardrail adjacent to the stormwater feature. Um, erosion controls will be installed 
uh, throughout the construction period, which is anticipated to start this September. And then all the plantings are proposed uh, uh, this later this, in the fall during the planting season. Next slide, please. This shows uh, the proposed planting scheme, uh, lists all the native plantings. Um, so overall, this is a tremendous ecological uh, benefit to the, to the park, uh, certainly addresses uh, climate resiliency um, uh, by providing um, you know, a good corridor for migrating animals um, that are best suited for, for this region. Um, and pollinator uh, species, and it provides a, a host of uh, food sources. Um, all the plants have been designed to, to provide a net ecological benefit. Um, that's, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, happy to answer questions. What I, I will say is Paul Sutton has been meeting um, with the Boston Water and Sewer Commission. Um, they will be, uh, um, as part of the project, they're going to be, or I don't, I take that back. I don't know who's installing part of the, whether it's them or or through this contract. Um, hoods will be installed um, within the existing catch bases within the street um, that feed and um, this area. Um, and they'll, they'll, they've committed to be doing uh, inspections on at least an <clears throat> annual basis um, of, of the catch basins. There is going to be what I neglected to say, kind of a new um, improved drainage outfall. Uh, currently, there's just some riprap dispersed in the general outfall area, but that's going to be cleaned up um, and, and, uh, and improved to better mitigate um, any of the of the runoff. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, I noticed that Paul <clears throat> Paul Sutton, our urban wild manager, uh, is on the line here. Um, Paul, do you have anything you wanted to add? I don't think so, just that we're really excited about this and we think of it as partly a, you know, restoring the area to what it was, the basin, the stormwater basin to what it was originally designed to be, and then really doing a lot of restorative cleanup of construction debris when this property was previously private. So we're, we're, we're excited to uh, move forward with this. Great, thank you. And thank you for all the work you do for the urban wilds uh, and the parks department writ large. Um, quick question, and uh, Paul may be able to answer this as well. Um, several of the commissioners have been uh, on little volunteer junkets, um, working on invasives and plantings. Is that the plan here? We'd be using volunteers? Yeah, I think I think for what, what we're proposing to do for this site is we're, we're proposing to use uh, existing staff, some newer staff members to really closely monitor this site and uh, keep it in really good shape going well beyond the, the construction contract. But <clears throat> we're, we'll definitely be uh, recruiting our annual volunteers and the green team, the Southwest Boston CDC green team, youth green team, they'll be helping out here too. Fantastic. And, and I know from personal experience, your um, training of volunteers is very comprehensive. So, um, I guess that that takes away one of my questions. I think you're they'll, they'll be in good hands if they go out there. They'll know what to do. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Allison. Do you have anything on this? Yeah, I just had one item, which was that the application notes that chemical treatments may be used where appropriate. I think prior to construction, we might just want a little bit more detail on the proposed use of chemical treatments. Fair enough. Okay, good. Before I go on, just want to remind members of the public to provide public comment, please raise your hand or type in the chat the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Enviro and using the hashtag ConCom hearing. Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, you mentioned the guardrail along where the stormwater feature would be. Is there any other berm or anything to keep somebody from backing a truck up and dumping debris, uh, or is it just kind of open? Andrea, do you want to take this? Yeah, I mean, there there are no other uh, barriers, my, my understanding. Um, so, I mean, I, I would... 
I guess that's something that could could happen. I, I live in Worcester and that's that's certainly a problem that we, we see on more of the quiet streets where there are open space areas. I guess my hope is in a residential setting that this would be curtailed to some degree, but um, you know, there, there's technically nothing that could stop it. All right, I just, it was just a question. Um, and the other question I had, maybe Allison knows it, under the order conditions when this private drainage system was put in servicing the private roadway. Does it require the builder or the owners of those properties to maintain the drain system? Do you know? Um, Chair, our default order of conditions asks for the maintenance, the perpetual maintenance of any stormwater on the property or within the project, if that's what you're. Right. But there's, um, that's a, a Sharon Street there is a private roadway. And therefore, the the maintenance of the catch bases, et cetera, falls onto the owners of the private roadway, which turns out to be split between the parks department, I guess, and the homeowners on the other side. And I'm just curious. Um, I know I know staff has been working with Paul, and and getting you know hoods on and make sure it's going to be built right this time. But I'm looking like five years out. Um, who who's going to take care of this? It's just a question. So Paul says he's yeah. got information. Yes. So <clears throat> that's correct. The homeowners are responsible for the maintenance of the roadway under the deeds and the development agreements and technically the maintenance of the outfall as well. Um, so that, and that is mentioned in the order of conditions. Um, regardless, we have to take care of the CONCOM property. So we're going to do everything we can to restore um, some of the damage that has happened there, correct it. And we will, park staff will certainly stay on top of this, uh, the maintenance of everything on the BCC parcel. The roadway, um, again, the, the residents are responsible for water and sewer has indicated that they've done yearly cleaning of the, the catch basin. So we, we, um, we, uh, we hope that that would continue. Okay. It's just, it's just tough that if, if nothing happens, the water sewer can clean it, but when it breaks or whatever, it gets difficult. I'm not trying to lean it on the parks department, but it's just, it's a no man's land here. And I was just curious uh, when the original developer, the original building owners, is that order of conditions, the original one, applied to them? Do they know it? That's it's something maybe you can follow up, Allison, on that. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That, that's all I had. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Conan. Thank you, Chair Parker. This looks like an exciting project. Can't wait to visit once it's done. Um, just curious uh, to understand. I think Paul may have already answered, but just this is a confirmation that the construction debris, is that something that was there from before or, or is there new debris being brought there? I think some of the debris was from, uh, I would say poor installation, poor construction, kind of sloppy, um, sloppy work. But then a larger part of it was from, um, I would say, degradation through yard waste dumping, a um, lot of yard waste dumping, and some random construction debris. Um, typically, when we've restored these areas and really stayed on top of them, we those kind of uh, dumping, illegal dumping issues seem to diminish. So we're, um, we've seen that on other parts of the property, at least. So the hope is when there is no obvious sign of negligence or maybe more obvious sign of care, the, um, the abuse will go down. Absolutely. And the guardrail, we're hoping to put up an interpretive sign there that can explain the values of that um, outfall in the restoration. We actually we memorialize the, the restoration, the work that's, be that's being proposed in writing. And graphics. Great. Yeah, I think the signage will help. Some 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 education there is a good idea. Just also want to understand very quickly 
the there's storm water coming from outside into the space. Is that correct? Correct. The, yes. road, the roadway runoff from Sharon Street. Yeah. Uh, is goes into uh, two or three catch basins, and that ca that ca those catch basins discharge through a pipe onto um, the urban wilds property. Do we know how it the space fared in like rainstorms, like serious rainstorms? You want to answer I, that? I think that's the challenge with these private streets. Um, the perpetual maintenance like Commissioner Sullivan had indicated. And I think it's something to consider in any kind of future development of having the developer and the future homeowners responsible for maintenance on such an important thing as a roadway or stormwater infrastructure that then in turn drains into a, a city asset. So the solution, Paul, is what? Sorry. I I, I think it's I think it's a, a challenge with the, the the private roadways. I know there have been votes put before the residents to potentially turn the street into a public street, but those have not been. Um, residents didn't vote in favor of that. Um, and uh, I think you see it all over the city. The private private streets, the condition of them is quite poor. And um, I think uh, I, I think it's a challenge, but all the, the deeds with those homes on the houses do indicate clearly responsibility for maintenance of the roadway and the outfall. So yeah, I guess my takeaway is it could be subject to serious flooding and then we'll have to watch what happens. And respond accordingly. Thank you. Right. Okay. Yeah, and to that point, just to um, clarify a little bit, uh, yeah, private roadways are definitely challenging uh, owners zone to midline or center line, uh, and whether they have uh, it in their deed or not, there there is a responsibility to maintain private ways. So um, I would imagine at some point, Paul, uh, if you find it necessary, uh, you know, legal team might want to contact homeowners and maybe enter into an MOU or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and part of the problem is it's going to be voluntary upon the um, homeowners. Uh, we've seen litigation like this before where um, I think maybe the city could enforce um, those private deed restrictions or requirements, uh, but probably not. Um, it would take one of the homeowners, I think, to um, uh, initiate litigation against the other homeowners to take care of the private way because they have standing. It gets a little complicated, um, so I'm sure that's the the challenge that you face. But um, you know, I think outreach to the um, homeowners once you get the property improved, you might find that they'll voluntarily co voluntarily cooperate. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Herbst, uh, no questions. I'm I'm also excited about the project, and I'll be I'll be down there regularly checking it out uh, to see your progress. I, I also am thinking, it, at least on the yard waste, uh, maybe that's something either the green team or your team could could do some good neighbor outreach for. Uh, so thanks. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, any comments from the public? I saw a lot of comments about roadway maintenance. I think we um, uh, covered that. Anything else? Yes, th those comments about roadway maintenance, and then there's a new question in the chat about um, winter road treatment as well. I don't know if Linda or Ms. Friedman wants to unmute and ask that question. Hi, um, thank you. Um, the concern is, um, you know, you have road salt is what I'm referring to with the winter road treatment for uh, winter storms. And how does that impact the uh, storm water runoff over time, you know, from season, to, from every winter season to season? Because it doesn't just, even though you may have, have some form of street cleaning, it still goes into storm water runoff once it starts thawing and melting. It has to go somewhere. 
right? And how does that impact um, the rest of the environment? That's the you know right there. Okay, who after is all, after doing all that restoration? Right. Who's responsible for the street uh, snow removal now? Do you know, Paul? I am. I am not sure. I imagine the even though it's private, I imagine that public works in heavy snow events comes and plows the street. Okay. Yeah, but what it is in that uh, it's a private way open to public travel, and the public works, although they won't maintain the roadway, will in fact plow it for emergency access, et cetera. So they, they do it and they also sand themselves. Okay. So Ms. Freeman, we have the uh, city's snowplow or snow removal um, techniques uh, and procedures and protocols that we have. Um, Allison, can you, um, can you shed anything else on that? I think we probably have that in our files. We, we do have that in our files and, and I can provide it we also, um, for this part of the project, that we do have a maintenance condition on the the uh, snow management plan for the the sidewalk and the and the actual urban wild itself. Fantastic, good, thank you. Uh, anything else from the public? Sure, we have another question um, from a Suzanne Mazert. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation, if that's incorrect. I can read it, or you can unmute and and ask your question, whichever you prefer. Can read it. Thank you. Okay. It says I am a homeowner on Sharon Street, and I am confused as to what you're implying this project might cost me. Who is that directed to? The homeowners that for for maintenance? Um, is that what you're asking? You started to talk about a, a going into some kind of memorandum agreement oh, with sure. us. And I mean, sure. I'm starting to get nervous. Yeah. No. I know the last time I've lived here for about 24 years and twice it's been proposed that we pay for the street to be repaired. The first time it was going to be 10,000. And I think the second time it was going to be like 30,000 a household. Mm -hmm. And so now when you're talking about us having to pay things, I'm starting to get nervous. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you nervous. Um, my observation was only that it's a private way. And generally, um, the maintenance of private ways is controlled by either an agreement between the owners or um, just by virtue of them owning a portion of the private way. And my suggestion was that at some point, if there is an issue, um, that maybe parks would reach out, talk to the homeowners and come to an agreement that, you know, we're going to take care of that, um, you know, stormwater drain over there. Um, but I'm not suggesting anything like capital improvements. Um, you know, that's, um, as Commissioner Sullivan just mentioned, that's, that's really going to be up to the homeowners. In other words, there's nothing we can do to force that issue one way or the other. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about the uh, confusion there. Okay. Anyone else from the public? We have a final question in the chat. Will the restored area be a part of a regular maintenance plan by parks? We we anticipate that that'll be a con condition uh, if the commission approves the project, that that would be a condition regardless if there's a condition that'll be part of our regular uh, ongoing maintenance of the, the site. Uh, remember this site was privately owned and now we're just restoring a lot of the previous damage. So we will assume responsibility for maintenance as part of our regular protocol. And, and sorry for the record, that was of Mr. Lewis Aliza. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, um, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing. Allison, are there any um, special conditions here that we have to add to this motion? I don't think so, right? Um, only if we want to see the additional chemical information. Oh, right. Yeah. But I don't think that would be an issue. I think. Uh, okay. I believe Paul was comfortable with that. Was that right, Paul? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. So with that, I'd entertain a motion to um, close the hearing. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Conan. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. 
Aye. And I vote aye, so that passes for nothing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay, Commissioner Conning, um, do you want to hang on until um, you have what? Another 15, 20 minutes? Yes. Do you want to hang on or do you want to make a clean break before this hearing? <laughs> I'll hang on. That's okay. Okay. With me. That's absolutely fine with me. Okay. Uh, we'll go back to the top of the agenda and thank you for uh, the patience uh, from the um, original um, proponents for slots one and two here. So uh, notice of intent for DEP file number 0061932 and Boston file number 2023. Dash 020 from Environmental Health and Engineering Inc. on behalf of the Hebrew Rehabilitation Center for Parking Lot Repairs and Ongoing and Landscape Maintenance located at 1200, 1200 Center Street in Roslindale, Mass. Resource areas are riverfront area, waterfront area, and bordering land subject to flooding. This was continued from the March 15th, uh, 2023 hearing. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Hi, I am Megan Fiorella with uh, Environmental Health and Engineering, our eh &E. um, and I also have uh, Bill Doyle here, our engineer. And we are just following up on a couple of questions that we had on the last um, meeting. Um, Bill will talk a little bit more about the storm filters that are added to the plans. Um, we added a little more text to the signage around the river. We added the, a little detail about Charles River watershed and not dumping. Um, we didn't go, want to go overboard on text, but um, you know, we can discuss that, but we want to make sure it's something that people will read. And we also looked into the um, snow melt um, substances that are being used. Um, it turns out what they have, what they have been using is a uh, calcium chloride liquid that's added to regular rock salt. And that's supposed to, the idea is to make it, uh, the, the product says that it'll use a lot less volume and that it'll sort of migrate less. Um, they did a price comparison for using pure calcium chloride or pure, pure magnesium chloride. And that was much more expensive than the current um, um, products. So I have sent some cut sheets and some details about that over, but that was just today. Um, and then we also added a little language into the landscaping plans about um, a backfilling with existing soil when they're taking out, you know, um, uh, invasive plants with roots that go really deep. Um, Bill, do you want to talk about the the updated plans here a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, we can't really zoom in or anything, but uh, the, the the big question, the big discussion that came up last time was to provide uh, more additional uh, treatment, more than just deep sump catch basins, which is what we had provi provided in the initial time. Um, and the idea was to provide more phosphorus, uh, phosphorus removal through more of a cartridge system. And um, I think uh, Mr. Sullivan pointed out the, uh, the jellyfish system, uh, we looked at that. Um, we ended up showing on the plans the the Kraken, which is, uh, is by the same company, um, but just trying to retrofit into the existing pipes uh, the jellyfish, you know, from rim to invert, uh, had a had a higher number, which would a larger number, which would have required us to basically pull up all the pipes and set them lower, um, which we didn't think that was a, a, a great idea. So we used one of their other products. Again, it's a cartridge filtration system um, that, that does that phosphorus removal, uh, but it just has a lower, uh, a lower head elevation, if you will, between the, um, between the catch basin rim and the, um, and the invert of the pipe. And it seems to be able to fit in with the existing pipe outfalls that we have there today. So really that's all it was. It's just, you know, swapping out of uh, the, the deep sump catch basins for not the jellyfish, but for the Kraken with a K, uh, you know, by the same company, but just a different filter cartridge that allows for a little tighter of a elevation there. There's actually a little more detail on that if you advance the slides too. Yeah. Okay. So you pulled it out. Yeah. Uh, oh, that was it. Yeah. So it's, so in, and, and, uh, you know, that's, it's their proprietary product here, but you have that storm filter cartridge on the left-hand side. It's a, this is a, a unit created and, you know, shipped by the contact people, same people that, that do the jellyfish. Um, and that, that storm filter cartridge is again, you know, a, uh, a, a, a phosphorus removal cartridge, but what you see there is a 20 on the, on the right-hand side, that 28 inches from, you know, from cr frame to, 
to invert, that's really the number we were trying to get to. And the, the jellyfish just had a, a higher number and we couldn't, we couldn't, we would have had to re relay all the pipes and, and new outfalls and everything. Uh, we thought that would have been kind of majorly invasive. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's the product uh, It seems to be doing, it seems to want to do what we want, want to do there as far as, as far as filtering that water a little bit better. Okay. Hey, Bill, um, what about changing out the filters? How often does that happen? And how can we assure it, it will happen? Um, well, we, we do add it to the operation and maintenance and there is, you know, the, um, the, you, you, you check it out. And, and if there is a lot of phosphorus in the parking lot, then it will need to be filled, you know, take, checked out uh, or, or swapped out more often. Uh, but the operation and maintenance from the contact people kind of spells out that that needs to be done and how it needs to be done. As far as, you know, the, um, the, the, the Hebrew Rehabilitation Center kind of keeping up with that, that'll be, you know, in obviously in your guys' order of conditions, it is identified in the operation and maintenance plan that we provided. Um, and there are the, you know, the, the, the sheets that they need to fill out and say, you know, we did this. Um, so it'll, it'll, it, it, the, the paperwork is there and the process is there, um, assuring that it happens is it's, it's, um, on my conservation commission in Waltham, which is a bit of a city. It's, that's always the toughest thing is policing these things to make sure they do happen. Um, but I do feel that the, the group out there is, is, uh, it really wants to do the right thing here. And they've been, you know, maintaining from, from, for, for years past. And they have a lot of new requirements now that they're they're becoming aware of that uh, hopefully they'll be able to keep up with it in the future. Okay, because I think we'd want to see in the order of conditions um, some sort of paper trail that uh, we can check on that when a uh, conservation agent has a little time, they could visit the office and look at the paperwork to make sure the filters have been changed out. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's a, the appropriate thing to put in the, in perpetuity into the, uh, you know, into the conditions. It's the typical thing that we do as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your service in Waltham. So thank you, job. It? It, it's thankless, but I, but I, I love getting out there <laughs> once in a while and getting dirty and, and trying to find out that solution to that problem out there. But I guess that's yeah. why I'm an engineer. Yeah, we do too. Thank you. Okay, um, before we go to uh, staff comments and commissioners, I want to remind members of the public to provide public comment. Please your, raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccfboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston and Byron and using the hashtag concom hearing. Allison, what do you have on this? I don't have any additional questions, just if anyone useful, I'm happy to recap proposed conditions that have come across the last three hearings. Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and do that? Or um, did you want to do that? Oh, I can do it. In, you know what? I can do it in a motion. Sounds we good. We already discussed these. So. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, Bill, you said you were going to put in deep sump catch basins, the ones with the hoods and all. And put this unit in? No, uh, no, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. uh, no, no, original, right. Originally, that's what we had proposed because right now there's nothing. There's just, you know, uh, they're kind of rickety old cement block, parged up, you know, catch basin inlets, you know, 24 inches by 24 inches. And, uh, you know, I don't even know if there's a bottom in them or they're just filled up with garbage. Um, uh, and what we were originally proposing was an improvement to that would be the deep sump catch basin. Uh, so we had, you know, a modified deep sump catch basin because we do have that tight to the, you know, pipe to invert, uh, rim to invert uh, dimension. Um, and then your comment at the at the last hearing that we were at was to to see if we could put in the jellyfish. And and like I kind of, you know, talked about, we, we looked at that, but that rim to invert was was too much. So we, we worked with the, uh, the Kraken product. Um, so it, what we're proposing right now, and there's only three inlets, three catch basin inlets in the parking lot. Um, so we're just calling those instead of, instead of the deep sum catch basins that we originally proposed, we're proposing the, um, the, uh, the contact that you saw in that detail. Yeah. So it would, the only thing that confuses me is you're going to have to excavate anyway, because they're small catch basins to begin with. Yeah. Um, the unit you're proposing takes care of phosphorus. What takes care of the suspended solids? Or is the maintenance plan such that you'll be cleaning these things a lot more frequently because there is no deep sump to capture the 
Yeah, there is kind of that that little that there is a sump, but it's not like that 24 inch, you know, the 48 inch, uh, uh, right. you know, four foot deep sump. Um, so yeah, there will be a, there will be a lot more uh, cleaning of it. Um, Does your stormwater manual call for a lot more cleaning of it, or a lot more at least checking it? It calls, for the, it, it calls for the checking of it. I think we, it was, you know, we typically did the two, two, twice a year. And then I upped this one to the four times a year to check it. Um, yeah. You can certainly, you know, look at what it would mean to, you know, every time they're out there mowing the lawn, uh, you know, once a week type thing. Um, Cause it's a quick check to see. Right. No, if it's four times a year, that's, that's appropriate. Yeah. I think that's what I put in there for this, but we can, we, I will, you know, if we want to make that a condition, I can definitely make sure that we did that. Um, yeah, well, the stormwater manual has it that they have to follow the condition yeah. be the all their own stormwater manual. The, I, I just bring that up. The other thing is that eventually the EPA has now um, acro across the city have, has a residual designation authority. So they will be coming for any property one acre or larger and making them get their own NPDES permit. And it'll be a lot more stringent than these units. So, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> a lot more fun for EPA. We'll we'll help share the burden of permits with you. Yeah, I... yeah. Nipdes is is getting. Uh, I don't want to say tougher, more uh, more stringent, more stringent. So that's good. I'm all set. Great. Thank you, thank Commissioner you. Sullivan. Uh, Commissioner Long. Uh, nothing new. Just wanted to thank you for looking into the salt alternatives and uh, looking into what you can do when you uproot plants. That's it. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Connor. Thank you, Chair Parker. Um, how does how how do you make sure all the water does go through the filter? The uh, the the catch basins end up being at the low points. I mean, that's where the water will will end up. Um, it the system is designed so that it has the path that goes through it for the you know the first flush storm events, and uh, you know they have a nice little graphic on their website and how the water flows through it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it ends up being about grading and, and, you know, hopefully when we do the, uh, when we do do the, cause this is ultimately is a paving project. Um, we'll, we'll just have to make sure that, you know, they pitch everything to the drains. It pitches now to the drains. So this really is kind of a, a grind and overlay project. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll just make sure that they continue to pitch to the drains. Yeah. If anything changes, then the water can't go through the filter, right? That, is that also like in the regular maintenance and, and like, oversight is that included to kind of make sure that the landscaping stays as intended uh the landscaping uh on one end of the actually it doesn't really change we just add we add plantings uh up and down the river one of the thing up and down the stream one of the things we did do though uh at the edge of the stream that doesn't exist today uh is added a, a added a berm added a, a catch a um uh uh, uh Berm, uh, curb curbing uh that has been consistent through the throughout the whole project that's not something new we we uh the water doesn't in most cases it doesn't flow from the parking lot directly into the river now it is pitched back to the catch basins but we did put that curbing there to uh, obviously it'll make sure that that can keeps the water in the parking lot and keeps it going through the system um, but it's also intended to be kind of a visual and a structural uh barrier for plows to you know Plows, they can plow up over anything almost all the time. But what, what we're hoping that it, it, it does is provide an edge, a visible edge that will keep uh, keep the plows riding along it and pushing the snow to where, <clears throat> to where we want it. Um, right. But to answer your question, it's the grading. Grading will do 99% of the job of getting the, um, the water to the catch basins. Uh, and then the curbing will you know provide a belt and suspenders, if you will. Great, thank you. Just la my last question. Is there any way to test the filter when they're removed to see how much phosphorus they are capturing? I know they've done that in the piloting products pro, uh, projects uh, of these to see their efficiencies. Um, I I don't know. I, I'm sure there is. Uh, you know to see how to see how well they're working. Um, I, I I haven't delved into that process myself, um, but I'm sure there is a way to do it. Great. Thank you. That's all, Chair Parker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Herbs. Uh, no questions. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, Allison, anybody from the public? I don't see anyone, no. 
Okay, so with that I would entertain a motion to um, close the hearing with special conditions that we discussed in prior hearings uh, regarding signage, uh, alternative de-icers like magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. Um, we do have the uh, Kraken uh, as our solution and also that we'll have um, uh, a paper trail, uh, regular maintenance um, um, reports uh, on site regarding the uh, change out of the filters and uh, also suspended solids uh, um, pursuant to uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Ornamental plannings proposed as optional would be required and uh, the condition that we, um, uh, we talked about requiring acknowledgement of the resource areas and their protection and responsibilities uh, by new staff. And excuse me for the interruption, Chair, we do have a hand up after all. Okay, great. Let's take the hand. George Marsh. Yes, hello, Commissioners. Uh, I'm a neighbor of Hebrew Senior Life Facility. Uh, been there uh, many times uh, for programs in the past. I'm very familiar with the brook as it runs right through the property. Um, I was not at the previous meeting when you discussed this, so um, I'm just sort of catching up on this. I will not repeat that. Thank you for the information that I've just heard. Um, my primary concern is just about the ongoing maintenance of the property in adjacent to the brook um, with a very sensitive resource running directly through the property, which is a very heavily used property, as I'm sure you're all aware, and uh, with vehicles traveling back and forth across it all the time. Um, my concerns about yeah, how the snow is, is um, removed in the, in the wintertime, I heard some of that was, was uh, responded to. Uh, but one thing that I, since I wasn't on the previous um, meeting, in terms of just the ongoing maintenance, and that's not strictly part of the repaving project, but since there is a maintenance schedule as part of the notification, um, in, the, in, in the past, I've noticed particularly during the primary growing season, um, that the ongoing maintenance includes uh, cutting, trimming vegetation down along the banks of the brook and including into the actual brook itself, which I question. Um, and, you know, it's not a lawn. It's, it, it, it directly abuts the lawn on the upper parking lot, the small parking lot for visitor parking. Um, which I'm very familiar with because I've parked there many times myself. And the lawn that's up there, the grass uh, extends to the top of the bank and the maintenance crew seem to just go down and cut off all of the vegetation that grows up within the stream channel itself, which I very much question if they should be doing that. And I just didn't know whether the commission had discussed that previously or not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I believe we had discussed that. Um, Allison, can you, in case I misstate that, uh, is your memory any better? I think that um, we spent a good amount of time talking about the uh, maintenance of the um, resource area and the buffer zone. Um, yes, we, we did talk about that and, and some elements that you just referenced in the conditions included uh, notices um, an awareness for the staff about the resource area to make sure that the maintenance staff were aware of the sensitivity of the resource area and were trained on it as well as additional signage in the space. Great, thank you. Okay, so I uh, put a motion out to the floor. Do I have any takers? Uh, so moved. I think we have a second. Great, thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Cotton? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye, so that carries five to nothing. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cotton, is this the time you have to excuse yep. yourself? Yep. Thank you, Chair Parker. Thank, Thank you. you all. So please let the record uh, reflect that Commissioner Cotton is left, and we're down to Commissioners Sullivan, Long, Herbst, and myself. Okay. Next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number 006-1931 and Boston file number 2023-014 from Niche Engineering Inc. on behalf of the Brook Charter School for the proposed construction of a new community field, walkway, restroom building, seating, storage area, and driveway located at 550 Morton Street in Mattapan. Resource area is a riverfront area, waterfront area, bordering vegetated wetlands, isolated land subject to flooding, uh, land underwater, inland bank, 100 foot buffer to uh, BVW and 100 
foot buffer zone to Inland Bank. This has been continued from the March 15th, 2023 hearing. And uh, who's here on behalf of the proponent? Hi, I can start us off. My name is Mark Loring. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Brook Charter School. Thank you so much to the Commission for having us here tonight. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of Brook, uh, and with me is uh, John Schmidt, Chris Hodney, uh, both from Mitch, who represent the engineers on the project, and then also uh, Ty Johnson from Warner Larson, who represents the, the landscape architect for the project. Uh, Great. We'll just go to the next slide. Uh, just to remind the commission of the project we're speaking of is at the corner of Morton Street and American Legion Highway. Uh, it is currently in, uh, previously, uh, well, I'm sorry, it's part of the state hospital site development uh, and it's uh, envisioned to be an open space and active recreation uh, site, uh, which includes a um, soccer field with inlaid softball field, as well as walking paths, passive recreation, uh, seating and gathering areas, uh, extended sidewalk that actually goes down to connect with existing sidewalk in, in that part of uh, uh, Morton Street where no sidewalk currently exists, as well as a restroom facility, um, some storage uh, pods for, for equipment and maintenance, uh, and an emergency access kind of drive. Um, the, the site is, I, well, again, I won't go too much in because I know we, we presented all this last time, and so we can uh, go to the next slide to the, the questions that were brought up last time by the commission. Um, it, the, one of the questions that was brought up was questions about kind of the uh, the trees and the canopy, and for this, I'll pass it on to my colleague, uh, Ty Johnson uh, from Moral Larson. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Mark. Um, so there were, we're coming back today with some additional information for you um, based on some of the feedback we received last week. Um, uh, right off the bat, I just, just wanted to uh, address the concerns about the, the tree report that was prepared. It was prepared by a certified arborist. Um, Bartlett tree experts are well known in the area. Um, that tree report uh, with the recommendations for those trees was sent to the commission. Um, we also just want to make a note that the arborist was doing this report uh, without any awareness of the um, proposed design. Um, they were looking at each individual tree, um, assessing each the condition of each tree. Um, and what I want to do is uh, we, we prepared a couple new uh, graphics to better understand of what what is happening with these existing trees as, as a result of of the design and and what we are proposing. Um, <clears throat> now let me just start out by saying that the within the hundred foot uh, setback of the resource areas, there will be fifteen trees removed total. Um, Fourteen of those trees, or sorry, excuse me, four of those trees are part of the sidewalk extension that goes four hundred feet to the south. Um, those are within the eight within basically within eight to ten feet of the curb. And in order to build the sidewalk to the mass DOT requirements, um, those trees will need to be removed. So th those are four, at least 11 left within the, the site of the field itself. And I, I'm gonna show you those each, each one individually. Um, and the numbers below that, uh, so we are proposing 27 new trees within the 100 foot setback of the resource area. And I'm gonna show those in the next graphic as well. Um, and then just to summarize, there were 209 trees in that overall report. Um, of those 209, 74% were considered healthy, so in fair or better condition, not dead and not poor. Um, and we are re removing 73 total trees, but, of, but only 43 that are considered healthy trees. We are proposing 84 trees, um, which are gonna be full-size nursery stock, two and a half inch caliper up to three and a half inch caliper, as well as white pines. Uh, we have 20 to 30 different species, all native. Um, and we, in addition to that, we are proposing uh, a forestation area, we're calling it. It's along the slope between uh, Olmstead Green and the field. And those 31 saplings, which are three quarter inch to one inch caliper native trees, uh, are intended to revegetate and naturalize that slope. 
And I'll show you on the plan where that where that area is. Um, so in the end, ultimately, we have an uh, increase in total trees after the project is complete. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this graphic shows you the limit of work in blue, which is the dashed blue line. <clears throat> the orange represents a 100-foot setback line. And in uh, the purple-pink color, you can see the, the location of the field, um, the, the rectangle, essentially, how that fits in here. Um, and we spent quite some time trying to fit that rectangle in the best location it can go maximizing tree preservation on this site. The little red X's represent the trees are being removed. Obviously, if it's if it's inside that orange line and has a red X, that represent a tree within the 100 foot setback to be removed. And that uh, list is in its entirety on, on this slide as well. Those are the 15 trees that will be removed. Um, like I said, four of those are actually off this page down the, down the street within a 400 feet to the south on the right on the page. Um, and then the rest are, the vast majority of them are where we're proposing our, our emergency access um, on that bottom right of the slide. And uh, at least one of them is in poor condition. Um, and that one is uh, all represented off, off the page uh, down to the right on Morton Street. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so this is the proposed trees. We've outlined those with the green lines. Uh, most of the proposed trees have the plus sign in them. Um, and these are the 84 trees uh, plus 31 trees. So you're seeing rough, what, 135, I do the, number, the math right, 120, 100 and, uh, 200, 115 trees total. So uh, the top corner um, on, on the page uh, is our reforestation area. Um, that's not to say the rest of the area won't be naturalized as well, but that's where those saplings were focused, which is above that black line that kind of cuts at a diagonal, but below the blue dash line, there's 31 trees in there. Um, the rest you can see within the buffer zone on the left side, is the majority of the trees we're proposing within the 100 foot setback are over on that side. That's really the area that we're going to naturalize and have a proposed sidewalk or walkway going through there with benches and so forth. Um, and then the drop off area, which is on the bottom right. And I, we have a blow up of that to show. There's two new trees in there. Um, there's really not a lot of space in there. I mean, we're really trying to minimize impact. So there's really not, very little space to actually plant new stuff in there, but we do have the two trees in there. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, so this is the, the zoomed in area of our, our pull off area um, for emergency vehicles. Um, and you can see here the, the, um, the wetland buffer line, it's a little bit lighter on here, but that's in orange. The farthest one out is 100 feet. And then there's two more orange lines, uh, 50 feet and 25 feet setback. Ty, um, Ty, I'd like uh, to speak to this. Please, yeah, John. So at the at the previous hearing, uh, Commissioner Harris uh, had some questions regarding our proposed emergency pull off area. So the the area is uh, will be gated um, and re restricted only to emergency personnel or possibly uh, material deliveries for the field. Um, the driveway itself, will, we originally proposed it as a uh, gravel pavement. I'm sorry, yeah, a gravel a gravel pavement with porous grid reinforcement. So it's a gravel service that allows infiltration. But we're also um, proposing, if the commission feels that this is a, a better uh, better idea, is we could instead of going with gravel, we could have a grass surface with um, a porous grid reinforcement. Both of them allow vehicle access. You know the green might the, the grass might better um, serve this use, but uh, I also like to talk about that we are outside completely outside the 25 foot riverfront area, and along the edge of that riverfront area, we're going to have a four foot wide black vinyl fence. This will protect the riverfront area from any trash or anything that might be blown or whatever possibly could happen there. Um, the and there was some concern about work within the waterfront area. That's the area from the 25 foot riverfront 
another additional 25 feet. So the portion of this, uh, this drop off, uh, impervious drop off area, it, we're impacted 437 square feet of that area, which, you know, is fairly, in my mind, is fairly minimal. Uh, we also looked at removing, you know, if we if we need to, to, to turn around here because we are on Morton Street and if emergency vehicles come in or delivery vehicles come in, it'd be an unsafe condition for them to try to back out into Morton Street um, when, you know, when they need to exit the property. Um, and, and again, uh, this is a, a seasonal use, so there won't be any salting or anything like that to this to this driveway area. You know, if there's snow on the ground, if there's ice on the ground, it's just going to rest there. If, if the field, if there's snow on the ground, they're not going to be using the field, nor would they have to open the gates for for our access purposes. So I hope that we've uh, adequately addressed um, the concerns of the commission, and we look forward to your feedback. If there is a preference between the gravel or the grass porous grid reinforced um, access, and I now I'll turn it back to Ty to discuss um, the field itself. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, the next slide is our last slide, and we just wanted to mention that um, we we forwarded through um, all the the information uh, we had uh, for um, the turf products that we plan on using, um, various information that we received from vendors regarding um, no PFAS content, uh, the testing that's been done on uh lead and so forth and i just want to mention and also the specification that will be used on this project um, which has very specific requirements uh for the project and that's actually included in the draft order of conditions um that full full pfas testing is done um as well as other testing uh which would all be as part of this project we actually have the materials themselves tested not just the materials that come off the factory line for this project would be tested for these items. Um, and just to just to mention again, the the natural infill that we are proposing, it is a it's made of southern yellow pine. It's a hydrophilic uh, material. In other words, the water uh, is held in in the pine particles uh, after a rain event, and um, so it does have a cooling effect essentially because of that versus uh, chrome rubber, the, the SBR chrome rubber, which we know has, um, has larger heat issues. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, but these are all the products that would be also were, uh, were submitted and specified for the East Boston project, uh, which were approved. Um, I think with that, I'd like to turn it back over to the commission. I will, I will jump in real quick. I'm sorry. I just another thing the commission had brought before as we uh, questioned the Article 97 protection on the site. Uh, we've made progress on that with uh, Parks Department, the uh, EEA, um, BPBA, and I believe Conservation Commission um, legal as well. If there are any questions, particularly about kind of where that stands, um, the attorney who has been uh, spearheading this across all the departments on behalf of the, the development. Paul Momney is here as well and can answer questions uh, as it relates to the Article 97 protection. Uh, Paul, I don't know if you just want to give a quick overview of where we stand with that, if that's helpful for the commission. Yeah, I think I think we're all set sure. for now. We might, we might come back to that later. Um, I think we talked about as a um, special condition that uh, there'd have to be a CR with some sort of protection mechanism in place before construction. Uh, so if we get to that line of questioning, we'll, we'll go to your attorney. Um, okay, thank you. So just want to uh, quickly uh, lay out the format of the hearing here. Um, a lot of the members of the public have been with us before, but um, what we do is I will now go to staff and fellow commissioners for their comments, then we open it up to public, public comment. Um, Excuse me. I just want to note um, that we've received comments from the following residents in support of the application, Allison Friedman, Arlene Calderon, um, Christy McGrath, Ebony Milton, Edgar Varela, Elaine Morgan, Ulisa Mejia, Karen James Duncan, Kitora Joseph, LaShonda Gaden, Leticia Perez, Loreen, I'm sorry, Lorraine Ruiz, Maria de Vago Edhart, um, Marie Paul Rock, uh, Marianne Chuwu, 
are Chuck Wu, I'm sorry, Michelle Porter, uh, Niha Barros, Odessa Jesus, uh, Richard James, Robert Mendez, and Winsome Wilk Wilkinson. Uh, comment letters in opposition uh, were submitted from Alana Feaster on behalf of the Morton Street 10 Residents Group, Corey Champagne, uh, Kyla Bennett uh, from Pierre, Jessica and Darren Spruill. Uh, letters that we had on file prior to the 315 hearing were from Dorothy uh, Alcenser, uh, Lisa Beatman and Rick Yoder, Mount Hope Canterbury Neighborhood Association, Louise Johnson, Mimi Turchowitz, uh, H. Parker James, Sarah Evans, Nancy Aleo, uh, Patricia Alvarez from the Southwest Boston CDC, Sarah Freeman, uh, Vikash Mohanka from the Sierra Club, and we're also presented with a uh, change.org uh, petition. So um, just wanna also uh, make clear, we made this clear at our uh, other hearing, that um, we have consulted with DEP on the Conservation Commission's um, jurisdiction as it relates to PFAS and uh, it's DEP's opinion that PFAS is considered a drinking water and a hazardous material regulated under MGLC uh, 21E, also known as the Massachusetts Superfund Law, uh, under the direct supervision of Mass DEP Drinking Water Program and the Massachusetts Contingency Plan. Um, the wetlands program at DEP does not consider PFAS to be a wetlands related matter uh, because the WPA does not mention uh, PFAS and uh, believes that PFAS is outside the purview of the commission and DEP on appeal. Um, they also furnished us with a, uh, the um, administrative decision from a uh, case, uh, EIP Communications, LLC, um, uh, in Westford. Uh, and in that matter, I'll just paraphrase quickly or just summarize it. Um, the um, uh, DEP upheld the um, order of conditions approving the work uh, for a similar type of turf field through an adjudicatory, adjudicatory process, um, finding that without citing a single, single wetlands regulatory provision, uh, that um, without any of those regulatory provisions regarding PFAS, uh, the, um, that it was uh, PFAS regulation was outside the jurisdiction of, in this case, the Westford Conservation Commission. Um, so with that, I would, um, I would go to um, Allison. One quick question, though, I guess it was for John. Um, Commissioner Herbst and I were out there on a very chilly Sunday, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, and the um, emergency um, pull-off that you're referring to is the one that is um, off of the highway there, down by the riverfront or down by the waterfront? It's off, it's off of Morton Street. Um, yeah. Yes. So okay. part of the um, <clears throat> part of design will allow for a, um, a, a drop-off lane for large buses. So the, the, the curb will be moved in about four feet for, to, yeah. to allow for a drop-off lane. And just prior to that, we'll have a curb cut opening that MassDOT's approved that will allow emergency egress into this uh, parking area. And you said it was gated? It will be gated, yes. Okay, okay. okay. Um, let me go to um, Allison first. What do you have on this? Um, so Chair, I would just, Add that we also really recently received an additional comment letter in support from Tasha Bromwell in the inbox. And um, I think other than that, I would defer to the commissioners on this item. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Yeah, um, I guess this one would be for John Schmidt or Chris. The, the pre and post runoff, you know, Canterbury Brook is subjected to flooding all the time. It's got some problems just transporting it. Uh, currently, there is, uh, when the water runs off there, it runs nice and slow, goes through wetlands, grass, et cetera. Now you're having a service, you are gonna be storing some water, but as I recall, all you ever mentioned was that you'll remove potentially 62% of the phosphorus, but we didn't know how much volume of water is going to go pre and post. So is there an increased volume of water hitting that brook because of the uh, runoff from the surface? Uh, give me a moment. If you want to go to another question, I will look that up. Uh, no, I've, I've got it up. Um, you know? So uh, no, so our stormwater report shows that there'll be a reduction for the two, five, 10 and 100 year storms in both uh, from the existing condition. Okay, I just want to make sure you 
spoke that on the record. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, that would be fine. I just, I just wanted for the record. That's all I had. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Long? Yeah, um, only thing I have pertaining to the uh, seed mix, I believe it's the restoration seed mix you specified in the waterfront area by the emergency pull-off. Just uh, wanting to make sure that that is maintained and is successful and that um, there's at least some recruitment of those plants in that seed mix. So I um, want to have that on the record with you all, but that's all I have. Was there a response to that? Uh, noted, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we would definitely be, uh, our office is involved during the construction of the project, making sure all the areas are, uh, seed areas are established um, and would be keeping an eye on that. That'd be requirement of the contractor and part of the specification. Okay, Commissioner Long, anything else? Um, I guess, yeah, how long, I think you may have mentioned this, how long do you anticipate the construction period being for um, uh, monitoring the seed mix success? Um, <clears throat> I would say that after the, getting the seed established will be something that goes beyond substantial completion. So um, after a project is open for business, we would require you know, open for use. Uh, the seed mix would continue to be monitored by the contractor uh, until we have full germination, uh, and money would, would be withheld from that contractor until until that's until everything is fully germinated. Um, so usually that might last a couple months, maybe two or three months, depending on how well it works. What time of year it is really makes a difference as well. Um, and then at that point, it would be turned over to the owner. Um, but if there was a problem, if, if we never received, if there was never a germination or establishment, then, um, you know, they would have to rework the area, redo it um, as part of the contract. Right. Does that answer right. the question? Yeah, thank you. And sure. I suppose if, if you see plants coming up that you don't want, um, those would also, would those also fall under the scope of work for the contractor to remove any weeds that come up in a seeded area? Yes, definitely. We would we would look for weeds. If they come up, they would be required to remove them during that maintenance period. And do, do any of you know off the top of your head what the specification would be for the erosion control mat? Uh, the we've been using biodegradable erosion control mat. Um, it's offered by North American Green is is one of them. Um, so that would biodegrade over time. Uh, no. Yeah, sure. All right. Thank you, Ty. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Herbst, I'm sure you'll do a much better job of uh, questioning based on our site visit. So please go ahead. Uh, well, I just wanted to talk about the um, emergency access. Um, uh, just to make sure I understood, th there's going to be a bus pull off, but that's that's still in the roadway. Yeah, yes, the pull off is within the roadway. This okay. And yeah, this this uh, access is restricted only to emergency vehicles. For instance, when they have a game day, an ambulance can park there in anticipation of an issue. Um, and you know, if they need to deliver, you know, hockey nets or things like that, or you know, soccer nets or things like that, a, a maintenance truck could pull in and do that. Okay, but it'll, so it'll be the gate will be controlled. Got it. Um, there is no there is no pull off though. No, just to be clear, there you, there was a pull off in a previous design, but the mass DOT uh, mixed. Like in terms of a, like a oh, curb pull off for the bus drop off, that that's like the only access to the site via vehicle uh, is the the pull in the emergency egress. Buses will park at the school, which is uh, and kids will walk down. Is that All right? Thank you, Mark. I'm okay. Um. So so essentially, this is for ambulances, and, and maybe some yeah. deliveries. Um. Yeah. So the I, I do uh, I appreciate your proposal to 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 using the grid kind of pavers, I think with grass would be great. Um, we've I've seen those used. At, I think that's particularly for a, a, a place like this that will actually not have a lot of activity. That's a great solution. Um, I did wanna ask, cause uh, I am st still really looking to move you out of that area as much as I can. And, and it seems to me that this is wider than necessary. Um, 
and I'm wondering even uh, you know if it went for it's 20 so the, the, the width itself is 20 feet which is a fire department minimal requirement for for access okay even even for that kind of an access and and also the turnaround I mean it's another the turnaround you know it's plus. 22 feet wide so that'll allow for you know two vehicles to turn around um we could probably make that narrower to say 15 feet wide that would really restrict it to one vehicle and and does it need to be that deep that's the other I mean, to turn um, around? The depth is, it's about 20 feet deep, which is what a parking space is. That's quite a bit deeper than the ambulance. Um, anyway, it, I, I guess I'm just thinking that you could do a little shaving there. Yeah, um, I mean, it, we it, we could we could make it 15 feet wide and we could probably shave five feet off its depth. I, I think those would both be great improvements because then you'll, you'll pull that back quite okay. a bit. And I, I would... Uh, I only ask that you make that a condition and we would share a drawing with you demonstrating that. Yeah, I, that's a, that would work for me. Okay, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Allison, um, I think you mentioned you might want to revisit the uh, conservation restriction. Maybe we, maybe we will talk about that a little bit. Um, sure, and I'm trying to get can, some confirmation on that. Um, Mark, I think, had a different understanding of the concentration restriction. So if Mark uh, maybe wants yeah. to propose that. No, I mean, I think it's just it is a, a unique setup because of uh, all the things we've all the agencies have been working with. Again, Paul on the is the expert and again, he's been coordinating with the state as well as parks and BPDA. Uh, so I, I turn it over to Paul uh, to just explain kind of what, what we are doing. And it's, it's a little bit different, but again, the goal is to put Article 97 protection on the site uh, to provide that protection and perpetuity. Paul? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr. Chair, and members of the commission um, and members of staff in attendance. So Paul Momney with Goldstone Stories, and I represent Lena New Boston, who's the master developer of the Olsen Green project in the partner book school on this this project the we initially went to the parks department in january seeking final approval uh from parks for a 80 unit mixed income phase uh of the old said green project um, um over on the other side of morton street uh, and as part of that approval um we discussed the the concept of um, open space restrictions throughout the Olmstead Green project, including this ball field. Um, we had been working for a number of years with the Parks Department uh, and others in the area trying to determine the best means of restricting this site for a perpetual open space restriction for active and passive recreational uses. The, the typical um, means of such a restriction in perpetuity is of course conservation restriction approved by EEA um, and typically granted from a private landowner to a municipality. Uh, here, for a number of reasons, I think mostly related to the, the, the nature of these improvements in being more of, of sort of physical improvements as opposed to land conservation it was determined that the 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 um, monitoring obligations of a grantee were just sort of too convoluted. So in a typical CR, the grantee has an obligation to monitor the the open space and make sure that it remains in the condition that it was essentially a, 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 as of the day of the grant. Oh. And here, where there's going to be you know substantive construction um, and a lot of hardscaped area, it just it didn't seem like the right fit to use a conservation restriction. And for that reason, um, the Parks Department, and as I understand, the, the, the CONCOM weren't interested in being the grantee under the CR. So we worked with the BPDA uh, and, and the Parks Department, um, and we looped in EEA for them to just confirm that what we were planning on doing was still going to accomplish the overall goal of ensuring that this uh, space be protected by Article 97 of the Master's Constitution. And what the the, the document that we've we've come up with um, is currently in draft form. We actually have a, a meeting with Parks um, and and the BPDA on Monday, but it, it follows a precedent that's used elsewhere where there's um, improved open space in the city. 
uh, and it's an open space easement granted to the, the BPDA for use by the public of the space. Uh, and it contains typical easement, um, you know, maintenance obligations. Um, it does allow some limited um, use by Brook for a period of time for their exclusive use. And it requires that the field be open to the public for a minimum period of uh, public use. So that is a document that we're, we're exchanging drafts with lawyers for the Parks Department and the BPDA right now. Um, EEA has confirmed that that document um, is of a nature that can confer Article 97 protection for perpetual open space uh, use on this site. So happy to address any other questions related to why the conservation restriction was deemed not to be the best plan of action here or how we came to the open space easement. Um, but that's sort of the, the, the state of affairs as they are. And like I said, after Monday's meeting with the BPDA and the Parks Department, we'll hopefully uh, be able to get to a final draft that we can share with the commission. Um, and and we'd be looking to to grant that open space season to the BPDA as soon as we get to a, a, a resolution on, on the form, the final form. Okay, thank you, Paul. So let me let me try to summarize or paraphrase what you just said. So um, mm -hmm. what would happen in this scenario is um, the um, you would would you transfer the land to the BPDA and then uh, they would also get a uh, public easement uh, or they would be granting an easement to the public for use uh, and there would be something in the agreement that would call this area a park so that it would be um, subject to Article 97 protections. Is that that what you're suggesting? No, so Brook would, would remain or the, the the Brook special purpose vehicle that's that's currently owns the property would remain the property owner. The the open space easement grants um, the right to the public to use the field. And it essentially designates the BPDA as oh. the 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 grantee on behalf of the public for the ability, you know, who, who's given the ability to enforce those rights and ensure that Brooke as the property owner um, maintain public availability and and keep this as a accessible and and um, maintained and publicly available space. Okay. I, I, as to how as to how it confers Article 97 protection, um, you know, we've we've gone at length with with uh, the Parks Department and EEA to get everyone on board. Um, the the Article 97 uh, attaches to a property when either fee or easement rights are granted with express intent that the property um, or easement be uh, in uh, in the public use uh, in perpetuity for um, active or passive recreational uses. So we have language in the open space easement that essentially just, it's, it's quite similar to what you see in the CR. Um, it's just mechanically a little different because it doesn't have EEA and the municipality um, as as signatories. It just would be between Brook and the BPDA, but it contains similar granting language where it it expresses um, uh, an unequivocal intent that the that the property be maintained in public access in perpetuity, and and that the protections of Article ninety seven uh, attach to the property. Okay. Okay. Um, so by virtue of the magic words, uh, uh, easement to the public in perpetuity for passive recreation use, that's what triggers the Article 97 protections. Yeah, in fact, we're a little more on the nose where we, we just, we say it's the grantor's intent that, that, you know, for the avoidance of doubt that this, this grant shall confer the protections of Article 97 on the property. And we, we have that, um, express language right in the document to ensure that there's no question uh, in the future of the intent of the grantor. Okay, uh, so Allison, I think the uh, trick here is uh, uh, it's probably the same process. We would like to see these documents before construction. Yeah, and mm -hmm. happy to jump in. I'm, I'm thankful for that additional context and happy that that meeting has been set up. I have spoken with the Parks Department today and the um, neither they nor the lawyers are yet, you know, happy enough to say that they're final because that that future work is going. So one potential option would be, as you stated, language that said either this is this is satisfactory or a conservation restriction is in okay. place. 
Okay, good. Okay, Paul, thank you. Um, okay, do we want to uh, go to the public? Is there anybody from the public who would like to testify? And, and be assured that if you testified at a um, previous hearing, it's all one uh, hearing that's been continued. Uh, so your testimony is on the record. If you sent in a letter, uh, either in support of opposition, that's also on the record. Uh, so it's not um, necessary to um, testify verbally, but certainly if you'd like to, uh, uh, we will take um, we'll take you in the order that you raise your hand. Um, who's up first, Allison? We have Kyla Bennett. Thank you very much. Um, I submitted a letter today, which hopefully you are all able to read. My name is Kyla Bennett. I work for public employees for environmental responsibility. I'm located here in Massachusetts, but Pure is a uh, national nonprofit. I have a PhD in ecology and a law degree, and I was the one who discovered PFAS in artificial turf. I am shocked and dismayed to hear what you read from DEP. They are wrong, and we will be appealing that. As you know, commissioners, the term alter under the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act is defined to include any destruction of vegetation or change in drainage characteristics or water flow patterns or any change in the water table or water quality. The fact that PFAS is not mentioned in the Wetlands Protection Act is like saying, because AR-15s aren't mentioned in the constitution, then they are okay. Okay, this is not this is not a reasonable interpretation, and we will be challenging that. The other thing I wanted to raise that does not involve PFAS, two other issues. One is the information that was submitted by both the landscape architect and the other information was there were so many misstatements of fact in there, it it was it was frightening. For example, there is PFAS in Brockville. Brockville does not significantly reduce the temperature of the field. Um, so many mistakes, they're all laid out in my letter, I'm not going to go into them now. The one other additional thing I want to mention is this. For those of you who have read the IPCC report, you will notice that in figure seven, this is the IPCC report that came out just two weeks ago, you will notice that in figure seven, it says that to combat climate change, we must leave our trees intact and keep our natural ecosystems intact as much as possible. That will give us more to fight climate change than all the wind power, for example, that we could possibly build. So I would urge the Conservation Commission to think a little bit outside the box here, because this field will contribute to climate change. It will adversely impact your wetlands and your waters. It will harm your athletes. And it's really an awful, awful idea. There is a bill pending in the Massachusetts legislature to ban artificial turf fields for all of these reasons. You have a duty to protect these wetlands. This habitat, this ecosystem, and these waters, and this artificial turf field is not the way to do it. My letter also outlines all of the other chemicals that are in Brockville and artificial turf. And so if you can't regulate PFAS, does that mean you can't regulate any chemical? That doesn't make sense, and it flies in the face of the Wetlands Protection Act. Thank you. Thank you. Um, who's next, Allison? Alana Feaster. Hi, I just wanted to uh, dovetail on what Dr. Bennett was saying. So I, I am too very upset at the fact that PFAS is not being considered as Director Butters, and there's a few of us on the call here. We will be impacted for generations to come. Our children will be impacted from the contamination that this site, everyone knows will cause. Um, the information and the supplemental material that was provided by the proponent has all outdated information. PFAS was discovered in 2019, so they're providing information from 1968, 2015, 2017 to substantiate why they feel that this toxic turf that will contaminate the wetlands, contaminate the Canterbury Brook, and contaminate our children and our families for generations to come is safe. Would they put it in their backyard? I know they won't, and I'm sure they live in tree-lined streets that don't have artificial turf fields contaminating their children from sunup to sundown. It is unbelievable that in an environmental justice community, when the science has been presented, the doctors have sent in information, clients, climate scientists have provided documentation. Our health matters to us. These people who don't live in our community are coming in here and dictating what we need to be dealt with to, uh, for the rest of our lives. It's unacceptable and we will be appealing to the highest levels possible because our life is non-negotiable, our health is non-negotiable. Their supplemental material was filled 
with lies and misleading information to this commission. And I really hope that it's denied tonight on every element that we have discussed because this is unbelievable that they're still proposing and under the guise of they're doing something great for our community. We live here. We know what we want in our community and a super fun site is not what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Allison, anyone else? We don't have any other hands raised. We do have a number of comments that are in the record in the chat. Okay. okay. So um, being in the chat, they are preserved for the uh, record. So with now that, have a, we now have a new hand that's been raised. Okay. Yvonne um, Lowry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Yvonne Lalier. Um, I I am uh, a member of the Friends of Mania Casa Boulevard. We uh, um, we formed a campaign that was successful in uh, saving the trees on the boulevard, and I am uh, appalled at the the uh, nerve of the proponents of this project to propose to eliminate 74 mature trees to put a, uh, a, a playing field in its place when there is plenty of testimonies and uh, evidence that there is enough open space in the area for the public and that this is an unnecessary project. Um, I hope that the commission uh, pays attention to all of our testimony against this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Allison, anyone else? Um, Derek Evans is unmuted, but the hand is not raised. I'm not sure whether he's seeking to speak. Yes, thank you. I'm trying to raise my hand, but I, I'm not, I'm sorry, this is a little different. That's okay. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, thank you for hosting the hearing. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, I just want to give a shout. Uh, myself, and I know probably at least one other person on this uh, meeting, uh, knew Senator Ed Brooke. He once lived on Ruthven Street in Roxbury. And I know uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that were he alive today, uh, I think two things I can say for sure. Uh, he would be very uh, adamant uh, that the, the children of that community and of this uh, area served by the Ed Brooke Charter School would receive the very best of all academic, recreational, uh, community discourse about issues like this uh, that they deserve, uh, including uh, adequate play areas, uh, as well as environmental justice, uh, as well as protection and prevention of the very items listed by this uh, commission in the purpose for this meeting. In the brief paragraph citing the two enabling pieces of legislation, Boston and Massachusetts, justifying this meeting, uh, CONCOM uses the word protect or protection four times and prevention twice. And under those two words, it identifies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, very important matters to either protect or prevent. And in the discussion of this project, uh, which I'm new to, admittedly, um, I am very concerned, uh, alarmed even, and fearful. Because what I don't see here uh, is, it, it, I'm, well, look, first, the school, the Ed Brooke, Charter School, I think is in, believes in good faith that it's doing the best thing for the children, for the community, and for the environment. With the, uh, the general idea, the, 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 the things that are being discussed here about doing so forth. But the fact of the matter is that despite that intention and that effort, this is in fact several, critically several of the listed uh, protective and preventative goals that ComCom has identified and that are, are supposed to be, steer me in my participation in this meeting 
um, th that are not uh, being protected, or I don't think it's adequately protected or prevented in this project. First of all, it is an environmental justice community. And I'm also sure that uh, Senator Brooke would be very concerned about that. We are in an era of climate change, and the late Senator Brooke would be very concerned about that. I hope that the, the Brooke School is teaching students uh, about not only the past and our late great leaders like Ed Brooke and, and, and so forth, but also how to be responsible stewards of their future locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. And that means modeling uh, the right kind of decision making community information and self-information that I think will place a higher priority than this project. And unfortunately, this commission, which is supposed to be uh, regulatory, is placing on matters like protecting public interest. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's a privately owned charter school, right? It gets paid uh, by the tax dollars from the Commonwealth that is impacting a publicly owned uh, and a multiple interest property uh, that has a lot to do with public uh, water supply, groundwater as a wetland. Uh, I don't know, but I imagine possibly fishery at some level, maybe shellfish. Has anyone asked, is there any shellfish? This commission is here to protect according to the uh, language, that among other things, and the prevention of pollution, flooding, and uh, storm damage. Now, frankly, the altering of a wetland habitat is absolutely, absolutely anywhere where I come from on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, midpoint between New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama. My ancestral community is in an, in a, in an internationally known climate justice, environmental justice of its life after being founded by former slaves in 1866. And, and the last and only line of defense that we have there, and that I dare say people in this area of the community of Butters and Mother for their public and environmental health is the responsible stewardship of wetlands, groundwater, surface water, habitat, and canopy, not just canopy, and by canopy, Mr. Evans, uh, and I hate to break in, I just have to ask if you could um, uh, start to wrap it up. We've got uh, other people and we have other hearings tonight and I understand what you're saying, um, but if you all could. Right. Well, I'll say, first of all, this is an environment, this is a quintessential environmental justice issue. It is a quintessential wetlands protection issue. It is a quintessential runoff pollution issue. I can't even imagine a, placing a PFAS laden uh, plastic turf field anywhere today, in today's age with the known science, much less in a functioning wetland that's publicly owned in the city of Boston, adjacent to a community named after Frederick Law Olmsted, I mean, and, and by a school named for Ed Brooke. This thing is fraught with irony. My last point is this. Um, it, I heard that uh, there is an, an obligation to maintain in perpetuity uh, as either an active or passive uh, recreation site, this property that happens to be a wetland and all the other things that I and others have mentioned, is the uh, construction of this project, which is going to take some amount of time, is that active or is it passive recreation <laughs> or neither? Uh, and is that time span part of perpetuity or not? Okay, thank you. Um, Allison, anyone else? I'm not seeing anyone else. Okay, great, thank you. And thank you to everybody who has testified and sent in letters. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing with the special conditions that um, uh, we've outlined before, uh, most notably the um, land restrictions and ma perpetual maintenance obligations, the agreement, whether it be Article 87 protections or the conservation restriction. Do I have that motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Long? 
Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. Okay, and I vote aye, so that carries for nothing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is notice of intent for DEP file number unassigned uh, from Weston and Sampson on behalf of Boston Public Works Department for the proposed rehabilitation of the Glenwood Ave Avenue pedestrian bridge that crosses the Neponset River and, and MBTA right of way located at Glenwood Ave Hyde Park Mass uh, resource areas, riverfront area, waterfront area, 100 foot buffer to Inland Bank. Who's here on behalf of the applicant? Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. This is Sam Moffat of Weston and Sampson. Um, I'm uh, joined uh, also by uh, Ben Sun of the Boston Public Works Department and Preston Huckabee of Gill Engineering. Um, uh, Preston is the designer of the project. Um, happy to um, provide uh, a brief presentation here describing uh, the Glenwood Avenue pedestrian bridge rehabilitation project. And Allison, if you can advance to the to the next slide, um, the next one, please. Uh, so this uh, project um, takes place in uh, Hyde Park. Um, again, the, the um, facility uh, is an existing pedestrian bridge that crosses the Neponset River and also crosses the MBTA commuter rail tracks um, in, the, in the area of the Truman Parkway and Glenwood Avenue. Um, and uh, if you can go to the next slide, please, Allison. Um, here are several uh, images of the of the existing facility. Um, as you can see, it's a, a steel plate um, uh, bridge um, that uh, spans the Neponset River. Um, uh, there are there are no um, elements of the of the bridge that are uh, in the river at this point. Um, it's a it's a span of the river. Um, the bridge also, um, and it, you can't probably see it all that well, but in the left image um, you can see kind of in the in the top left hand corner um, there's a, a second segment of the bridge that crosses over the MBTA uh, railroad tracks back there um, as you can see the condition of the existing bridge um, is somewhat deteriorated um, and the public works department um, is proposing to uh, rehabilitate this structure um, and that will include um, the uh, rehabilitation of the uh, substructure, um, the superstructure, and uh, the wooden uh, deck um, that you see here. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, please, Allison. Um, you're, you're not going to be able to see much here, but um, uh, this, this uh, image um, shows you the uh, extent of the full existing facility, um, the span over the Neponset River, which is in the lower left uh, side of the, of the image, um, and then uh, the, the additional structure over the railroad tracks, um, more or less in the middle top uh, portion of the image. Um, so the Public Works Department and Gill Engineering have uh, developed a design and a construction approach uh, very intentionally and deliberately to uh, avoid work in the Neponset River or in uh, resource areas um, subject to your jurisdiction under the Mass Wetlands Protection Act or the Boston Wetlands Ordinance. Um, there will be no uh, work um, in the in the river. There will be no um, vessels or or um, any work uh, impacting the water itself. Um, the rehabilitation work on the span um, will take place, uh, you know, um, from the top side, uh, and uh, um, there are uh, some minor um, uh, foundation rehabilitation um, activities uh, that I will point to in a moment, but um, uh, the um, a, an important point um, that I, I think it's important for us to make is that uh, the phasing of this project uh, will will be intentionally um, uh, set up to avoid uh, impact to the commuting public, um, and and um, so that uh, um, there will there will not be. Uh, work, extensive work proposed um, while school is open um, in particular um, to avoid um, uh, inconveniencing um, the residents of Boston who, who use this facility during that period of time. Um, we are proposing to do the work uh, during um, Boston Public Schools vacation period this summer. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, Allison. Um, so there, there are uh, essentially two elements of this project that um, take place uh, in resource areas. Um, the first is on the uh, western 
approach to the bridge um, on the Glenwood Avenue side of the bridge on the West Bank. Um, and at this location, uh, Gill has determined that um, from a structural standpoint, it's important to uh, replace um, the foundational um, elements of the bridge or, or to rehabilitate um, those. And, and, and one of the activities that they're proposing is um, uh, in introducing helical piles um, at this location. And, and um, uh, these helical piles, uh, if people aren't familiar with them, um, are uh, very minimally invasive. And, and um, what, what the activity will require is removing um, several of the uh, existing um, granite riprap stones in this location, um, lifting those out and, uh, and then uh, drilling these uh, helical pile devices uh, into the substrate um, to a location where they um, provide structural support for the facility. And then um, those uh, voids where the stones have been removed and the helical piles have been introduced will then be um, filled uh, with um, material to hold them in place. Uh, next slide, please, Allison. Um, on the uh, east uh, side of the river, um, what uh, is proposed is uh, making um, the existing foundation um, points, uh, some of them, five of them, um, more uh, rigid by uh, encasing them in concrete. And this activity, uh, again, will be um, uh, we'll minimize the, the activity in the, in the resource area to the extent that we can. Um, and uh, so um, that will require, um, you know, a little bit of work and, and um, hopefully not uh, too much. And, and so if we can go to the next slide, please, Allison. So again, this is a, uh, an image that you probably can't see very well on your screen, um, but we've calculated that um, uh, what we are proposing to impact um, is, uh, you know, as you can see, a small amount of riverfront, um, a small amount of bank, um, and a small amount of waterfront area. Um, and this is primarily temporary um, alteration uh, of, uh, of work in these areas. And you can see in this image here, the, the pink uh, areas are um, on the left side uh, where the helical piles that I described uh, would be placed. Um, and on the right hand side, uh, where the concrete encasement of the existing foundations would be taking place. Um, and uh, I, I believe that's my last slide. And, and um, we, of course, are happy to welcome uh, questions from the commission. Sure. Thank you, Sam. So, a uh, quick question How are you protecting um, or preventing debris from falling in uh, to the water while you're doing the work above? Sure. So the the structure will be shrouded. Um, will be will be wrapped um, in a in a containment uh, device. And and um, I could, uh, Mr. Huckabee, who's on the phone, could could probably speak um, in in more detail if that's required. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Um, this is similar to work that uh, uh, Boston Public Works did a couple of years ago with Central Avenue, um, and uh, the uh, system will be uh, hung platforms underneath the structure. Uh, there'll be rigid platforms to provide access to the workers. Those will be covered with uh, tarps. Uh, and then a, a, a shroud will be erected over the structure and that'll provide a, um, a containment system to prevent any debris from escaping. Uh, there will be a uh, what's referred to as a recycler, which is a large vacuum system uh, and, uh, and, and uh, that will be uh, parked on Glenwood Avenue. Uh, and, uh, you know, the contractor will be working with the residents along there um, uh, to try to avoid that to the extent possible. Uh, all the work will be done in the daytime. Uh, the vacuum system uh, will be piped to the various uh, containment areas, and that will uh, produce a negative pressure within the containment area, which will ensure that all the debris, dust, all of, the, all of that, uh, 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 material that's uh, created through the cleaning process will be vacuumed out uh, and that will prevent uh, any escapes uh, into the environment. Uh, and um, uh, to the extent possible, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, or I should say the, the material will, will be completely uh, collected and, and removed off site uh, and, and properly disposed. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, 
Allison, do you have anything on this? I think you covered it, Chair. Uh, other than they were issued a file number earlier today. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. I want to remind members of the public to provide public comment, please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Viro and using the hashtag ConCom hearing. Um, Commissioner Herbst, I know that um, you did a site visit, I believe, here. So why don't I let you go first to set the table? Okay. Um... One, I wanted to appreciate the use of helical piles. I think that's a, a good, that's helpful in terms of lesser disturbance. Um, so it, one question I had is your filing talks about needing to clear the bank. And I'm wondering what that means. Is there tree removal? Is there vegetation removal? Uh, and, I, and, and, now, and if so, I think we would want that quantified. Sure. So, um, Allison, if you if you could actually go back to the slide that has uh, the two or three pictures on it, um, you can see um, on the on the uh, west side of the span um, there are uh, some trees um, in the in the vicinity of the of the project, um, and I, I believe that there is one tree um, in that location that. Um, may be impacted and, and um, Mr. Huckabee might be able to. Yes, so we've we've gone through the site with the contractor um, on the, the, the two trees that are in the view uh, are not gonna be touched. There are some smaller diameter uh, brush uh, under the structure and alongside the structure that will be, need to be removed uh, to provide access and allow them to, to uh, get uh, structural steel in. Uh, on the bank that's being shown in the middle photo, uh, there's some small diameter trees that are near the structure that are going to need to be cleared away just to provide access. Uh, but none of the largest, none of the larger trees are going to be affected because they're, they're, you know, quite frankly, outside of the area that we're going to be working. So, um, so the, the larger bold trees will be uh, left in place. Uh, it'll be smaller diameter stuff that, that's more along the brush size and saplings uh, that they'll have to, uh, that we'll have to clear out. Okay, well, related to that, I mean, I think I'm guessing we will want to know a little more detail on that, but um, you, the regs require that the, that the project will be, as redevelopment, will be an improvement on the riverfront area, and you, and you said it will be uh, in your proposal, but you didn't say how, and I guess particularly since you are removing veg vegetation, I, it, it appears to me that you've done a great job making this minimally invasive, but I'm not sure I... I'd be interested to hear what you, how you would characterize it as an improvement. So um, uh, we we submitted the project um, as a as a limited project. I, I, you may have picked that up um, in sure. review, um, and and so um, our our approach has been to um, meet the performance standards to the extent that we are able to, and I and I and I think we have done um, a, a pretty effective job of of meeting the performance standards um and uh i, I think um on this on this question of of um whether we are um providing an improvement to the to the bank uh or the or the or the resource areas present um uh you know i, I think um you know we may be we may be sort of <laughs> in a in a place where we're where we're not doing harm um, but maybe not um, not improving it either. I think just to be fully candid, I think I think we're we're sort of um, maintaining the the integrity of the resource area. Um, and as and as Mr. Huckabee said, we we are um, not removing any mature trees, um, and and we are um, not going to be uh, impacting the um, riverfront resource values um, in this area. Okay. Well, Commissioner yeah. Herbst, just oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I I will say that um, this is a project is certainly certainly in the minority of projects that come in front of us that assert limited um, limited project status. I did look at the regs pretty carefully on this, and I tend to agree that it is a limited project. I usually don't, um, but I think in this case it's warranted. I understood. I I. 
I'd be interested if there's any openness to some kind of revegetation or vegetation work there. Um, the other question I have is just looking at the where the footings are now. Um, although I think when I was there, the river looked lower than that, but um, it looks like erosion control is going to be a challenge. Uh, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that. Uh, so the those footings that are in the middle photo, uh, the footings themselves are not going to be um, touched, essentially. The oh. steel that's on top of them will be. Uh, the helical piles are, are uphill, upslope of that, behind that pier, between the uh, between that pier and the roadway. And then there's another line that's going to be in, in the middle. Um, so we will be putting down sedimentation barriers uh, along the slopes uh, in between where the work will, is occurring. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the bottom of the bank itself. Um, in the right-hand photo, uh, we don't have a photo of the, the foundations that we're gonna be accessing uh, on the portion uh, that's running along the bank on the east side of the bridge, uh, excuse me, the east side of the river, but the uh, foundations that we're gonna be accessing again are on the uphill side yeah. because the structural steel is buried and we need to expose that to access it. Uh, the downhill side, it's concrete. That's that's exposed. We won't be touching that concrete either. Again, it'll just be the structural steel on top. Okay, thanks. So, so are you telling me the erosion control for in the middle picture will be on the up, upside of those? It will be just upside of the pier. Got so it. it'll be between, you know, to, it, it'll, it'll essentially be running alongside the pier itself. Okay, thanks. N no more questions from me. Great, thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Yeah, the helical piles are in addition to the existing piles that are there, are the support columns. You're not going to remove any support columns? That's correct. Okay. How deep are these helicals going? On the curious. order of 15 to 20 feet, uh, we did receive information uh, from Boston Water and Sewer on the presence of a water line running parallel to the bridge, and we certainly appreciate that, and we are absolutely going to uh, go out and, and uh, you know, uh, determining to the extent possible exactly where it is and, and figure out some clearances around it and ensure that we're not going to uh, impact that. That's certainly not something we want to have happen. Right. So, yeah. Well, uh, that was going to be my next one. I want to make sure you didn't find it. So that, would be, <laughs> I agree. that would be a positive. It would um, be, a, it would be a, a bad day. So we don't want to have that. Right. And, and finally, you're, you're doing all this work and at the end of it all, this will not be ADA compliant, I take it. So we're just fixing what we got. Is that how that works? Oh, uh, maybe I'll defer that also to you, Mr. Huckabee, but I, but I think the answer is um, that we are providing um, uh, improvements to um, the handrail um, such that um, the handrail is, is um, improved for public safety. And, and um, with respect to ADA, uh, we, are not, um, we are not providing Update. It's a, it's a, it's an old structure, and I think um, uh, Preston, can you, can you speak to it? We're rehabilitating the existing facility uh, and uh, and bringing it back into compliance. Uh, the view is that um, you know, it, it, I, I think that the the, the uh, public works department um, uh, is is understanding that this this work needs to occur. Yeah, okay. I, I just wasn't sure when you touch something like that, whether you got to bring it up to standards or you're allowed to, because it would be so difficult. It'd be a whole brand new project. Um, I was just curious more than anything else. That's all I had. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I know looking at this as a limited, but I want to echo uh, Commissioner Herb's interest in a, potentially some vegetation added um, could even be in the form of. Uh, additions to the erosion control seeding. I know that there, you know, several seed mixes out there that you know could be suitable for this riverfront area. Um, so curious about um, willingness on the applicant's part for adding any uh, wildlife-centric seeding. Sure. If the if the uh, commission would like to add uh, a seeding requirement to the order of conditions, we can certainly uh, investigate uh, appropriate mixes to uh, to put on the slope. That would not be uh, an issue whatsoever. Excellent. Great. And uh, that's all I have, Chair. Great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Herbst, uh, the seating uh, option here. How do you feel? 
I feel like Commissioner Long is a great addition to our commission. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, sounds good. Good, thank you. Okay, uh, Allison, uh, anybody from the public? We had one comment in the chat from Yvonne um, Larry about the how many mature trees would be affected by the project. I think we discussed that, but if there's anything else, I think I think we've we've um, answered the question. And I'll just state again um, that we we do not intend to um, remove any mature trees. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so with that, I would entertain a motion to close the hearing, adding a special condition to the order of conditions um, requiring the, you know, Commissioner Long, I'll let you make this motion and fill in the blank here, requiring the type of seating that you discussed. Uh, so moved. Okay, did you want to add any color to the seating um, requirement? Yeah, um, a suitable mix for um, its proximity to the water level, example being uh, New England wetland plants as one uh, producer. Fantastic, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Aye. Commissioner Long. Aye. Commissioner Herbst. Aye. I vote aye, that carries four nothing. Thank you. Thank um, you. You're thank welcome. You very much. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda, we're moving around a little bit, is going to be the request for determination of applicability from Ty and Bond Inc. on behalf of Boston Gas Company, DBA National Grid for the proposed gas main replacement within a portion of M Street located at 220 to 230 M Street in South Boston. Who's here on behalf of the proponent? Hello, my name is Julia Novotny. I'm I work for Ty and Bond and here on behalf of Boston Gas Company. Okay. So Julia, haven't we seen this before? We? Um, no, so um, I was oh. here a couple of weeks ago for a different project on Columbia Road, which is- Okay, right I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the project is um, between 220 and 230 M Street in South Boston. Um, next, please. And it's the replacement of 230 linear feet of gas main. Um, sorry, that says Columbia Road <laughs> um, for M Street and M Street um, adjacent to Columbia Road. Um, so it's 230 linear feet of four inch diameter main that's existing. Um, it's currently cast iron main installed in 1912 and it's being replaced with 230 linear feet of an eight inch diameter plastic main. And so this is in M Street between Columbia Road and Marine Road. Next, please. Um, so the work will consist of the excavation of a trench approximately two feet wide um, and three feet deep to uh, support the pipe um, at that depth. And the trench will be excavated in M Street, but the exact location will be determined based on the existing, existing subsurface utilities determined in, in the field. Um, trenches will be backfilled daily and they will be restored in kind following the completion of the gas main installation. Um, and the co construction equipment that will be used is generally going to be um, excavator and dump truck um, mobilized on the roadway. So standard construction equipment. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, National Grid will use their standard best management practices, um, their erosion control measures like straw bale, silt fences, straw wattles, and um, catch basin silt sack inserts where necessary. Um, and all of the BMPs will be kept in good working order by um, the contractor and inspected after storm events. Next, please. Um, so the work is within partially within land subject to coastal storm flowage um, based on an 11 foot base flood elevation. Um, that was determined using LIDAR for our, our on our mapping. Um, so a portion of the work, approximately 62 square feet of impact, and that is about 31 linear feet of the gas main replacement is within the limits of land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, no adverse impacts are anticipated because the work is all within previously paved areas and um, there are no proposed changes in grades um, or conditions of the existing existing area. Next, please. And this is um, an aerial map of the, the area. So you can see 
the gas main replacement is, like I said, between Marine Road and Columbia Road on that portion of M Street. Um, and the southern portion of the replacement is within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, and similar to the Columbia Road project that I, I brought a couple weeks ago, um, this work is, is being done because of water main encroachment. Um, it's my understanding that the uh, Boston Water and Sewer Commission is going to be doing some, some work in this area. So they're proactively doing some replacement and relocation of the gas mains in this area. And that's all that I have. Are there any questions? Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, just wanna remind members of the public to provide public comment, please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you are calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at ccboston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Enviro and using the hashtag concom hearing. Uh, Allison, anything on this? Um, just a recommendation that the standard erosion controls apply and a question about the length of time the work is expected to take. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, length of time, this is a relatively short um, section of gas main. Um, I would expect probably um, a couple weeks, not, not very long. Um, and they plan to start work as soon as um, they have the applicable authorizations because like I mentioned, there's that um, water main work that's gonna be happening in the area soon. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you, Allison. Uh, Commissioner Sullivan. Yeah, as I mentioned last time, um, it, it's kind of ironic. They do move gas mains away from the water main so they can be put in and they put them square on top of our sewers and drains. So I would ask you one more time to ask natural, uh, National Grid to put the new main somewhere where it doesn't interfere with other utility work that will be following up in a year or two. So we get to move it a second time. So if we could just talk to them, they rarely do we get plans saying we're gonna put it here. They search and destroy out of the street looking for a spot. And there's always a nice spot on top of sewers. So we can just relay that to them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Long. I have nothing on this chair. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Herbst. No questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Allison, uh, any members of the public? I'm seeing none. Okay, so with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to uh, issue um, a negative determination of applicability with the standard erosion controls provisions. So moved. Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries for nothing. Okay, let's backtrack a little bit here. Thank um, you very much. Oh, well, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is unassigned DEP and unassigned Boston file number from, no, I'm sorry. We moved around. Where are we going back to? Here we go. Okay, sorry. Uh, next item on the agenda is actually notice of intent for DEP file number 0061926 and Boston file number 2023-0016 from Use Environmental Consulting on behalf of the Roxbury Home for Aged Women for the proposed ecological improvements, including invasive removal, native planting, and trail improvements located at 1225 Center Street in West Roxbury. The resource areas are Vernal Pool Habitat, 100 foot buffer zones to BVW and Inland Bank. Who's here on behalf of the proponent? Good evening. Tom Hughes with Hughes Environmental Consulting. Um, thank you for taking that RDA ahead of me. I appreciate that. Um, sure. I'm kind of in the middle of a 40B hearing in another community. So it's a. <laughs> it's Fine. a. So it's actually a pleasure to leave that hearing right now. Um, However, uh, so so I'm here on behalf of um, Sophia Snow Place, and uh, on the uh, on the uh, meeting with me tonight is uh, Miles Connors from uh, from Parterre Garden, uh, as well as uh, Patty Rogavine from uh, Sophia Snow Place. I believe is here as well. Uh, you may be familiar with this site. There, you entertained a uh, development uh, application for this site several years back. This is um, adjacent to the vernal pool that is um, uh, right 
right at Allendale Wood. And you've also issued a notice of intent for an adjacent area for, or an order of conditions for an adjacent area for invasive work uh, for the Urban Wilds Program. So uh, what you're looking at here is a picture. You can see Sophia Snow Place, the building at the very top, um, the vernal pool to your left, and you have Center Street off to your right. At the bottom of the picture is, um, I think that's Faulkner. Um, and there's a stream that is at the outlet of the vernal pool that runs into a pipe and then runs off under center that's an intermittent stream. If we can go to the next slide. I think you all know where it is, but you know I have an obligation to tell you where it is, 1225 Center Street. Um, it's right across the street from a project you were hearing, hearing from earlier. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. So here's an aerial photograph with the wetland resources shown. I apologize, my GPS entered two B12s. So that's corrected on your site plan, um, but I have a harder time correcting it on my ortho photo. Um, but you can see the, um, the vernal pool is the dark uh, area and the, uh, the location arrow is pointing to the area around the intermittent stream that leaves the vernal pool and then goes into a pipe. Um, and then uh, there is a trailhead that's also part of the project that's up above those B12 flags. Uh, that is the entrance to Allendale. And um, in that area, we're looking to improve the trail to give it a, an accessible slope. Um, because many of the residents at Sophia Snow Place um, are, uh, are mobility challenged and the dip in the trail right now creates a little bit more of a, a tough time for them to access, uh, access that trail. So if we can go uh, to the next slide, just wanted to show you it's not in a floodplain and it's not proposed to be in the floodplain in the preliminary map. We can go on to the next slide. It's another aerial photograph from the south. Um, we can go to the next. Okay, here, this is kind of a good one. You can see the trailhead, um, which is right at that uh, corner of the building where you can kind of see the bend in the sidewalk um, where uh, above the vernal pool where the trail kind of goes into uh, Allendale Woods. So that's one component of this notice. The other component is invasive uh, removal, control, and native plantings uh, down around the stream. And this is phase one. There will be a phase two notice coming for this property that will include um, an extension of the trailhead down to Center Street, a uh, public healing garden, and a bunch of other uh, really nice things that are uh, part of Sophia Snow Place's effort to, uh, to turn this into essentially an extension of Allendale Woods. Um, and at the same time, they're also taking some uh, some really good measures in areas that are not jurisdictional to the commission uh, in terms of the overall property. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so you can see the two clouded areas. You can see uh, the clouded area in front of you, and I'll have Parterre kind of go through that. But in that area, um, there are a number of invasive trees and shrubs. We will be uh, controlling those. In some cases, we're removing trees, cutting flush. In other cases, we will actually be um, leaving the snags in place. And uh, with the trees that are removed, one of the things we're doing in our phase two part of the project is we're trying to see whether or not we can get a portable sawmill to come in and mill some of that lumber up for use in the, um, in the healing garden and maybe planting beds, things like that, trying to maintain the stored carbon that's represented uh, by, by those large trees. That's one thing with a large mature tree is it tends to be a good storer of carbon, whereas a young forest like we're gonna be uh, installing in that area uh, sequesters more carbon as it grows uh, than, the, than the mature. So you can think of the mature trees as like your savings account and the, uh, the younger forest is kind of all the money you're trying to put into the savings account. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So this is an idea of what we want to do um, at the trailhead. So we will essentially be constructing a bridge with two trail-like abutments at each end, consisting of either timber or curbing that is laid out so we can uh, put in the, the stone dust um, aggregate material um, up to grade to basically bring it up so we can have the framing above ground. And then the bridge will go to the next um, 
one at the very end. And if you can picture from trail improvement to trail improvement, it will be a, a perfectly straight line at 5%. Um, and I have a picture of what that looks like in a similar application if we can go to the next uh, slide. If you look at that bottom center, that is actually a uh, trail that we did in Needham at, in conservation land. And you can see the curving and that curving is used to essentially bring the trail up to meet the boardwalk. That's a concept that we're using here. Um, you can see on the right, um, that is a bridge that actually goes out through wetlands. Um, and in that case, we used granite blocks, but the same concept. We need something to kind of contain the trail on either side, and then um, the boardwalk goes smooth and flat from there. Um, we show on the detail, if we can just go back to the prior slide, uh, what we show here is sauna tubes supporting the structure. We are evaluating the use of diamond piers so that would be less impactful, um, but we wanted to show you the most aggressive design since we're not sure we can use diamond piers and ask that you condition that we give you a final plan uh, for the construction of that, that um, you know, is either based on, on this diagram or, or one that would include diamond piers. Diamond piers are just little blocks that set at grade and you put three pins that are more or less like rebar into the ground and that um, you can actually build an addition onto a house with those things in the right setting, but we just haven't done any probe work to make sure that that would work here. Um, so we'll want to finalize that design, make the decision between timber and granite for the uh, sort of abutment, and I'm using quote air quotes around that, um, and for the uh, and for the support of the bridge, you know, the uh, the diamond piers. If we can um, go to the next slide. Um, so you can see on the upper left, the dip in the trail. And I don't know, I'm sure you guys have walked it. Many of you have at least walked that trail. As you leave Sophia Snow Place, you kind of go down and then you go straight up again, or not straight up, but, but up. And that little dip and then the steep slope makes it uh, awkward for some of the residents. So we're hoping to smooth that out. Um, there is a uh, drainage feature that was installed there as part of uh, your other order that was issued to parks for this area. And we have been in touch with uh, Paul Sutton about this design and about the overall approach and, and how this blends and merges and is essentially an extension of the work that, that he's been doing here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So this is a picture of the Vernal Pool area. Um, you can see in the upper center, the outlet from the Vernal Pool, and then you can see the, um, the stream is you know a, a good view of it? I think is in that bottom right one, um, and uh, and that's all been flagged. My flags are very consistent with two prior flaggings, both that done for parks as well as uh, that that was done for the prior uh, development. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Miles to give a quick run through of the uh, invasive protocol and the uh, and the replanting uh, that is proposed. So if we can go to the next slide. Okay, Miles. Thank you, Tom, and members of the commission. Um, just for the record, I'm Miles Connors with Parthia Ecological. Um, we're working with uh, Sophia Snowplace and Tom on this particular project as, a, as also a restoration from the outlet of this vernal pool down to the culvert on Center Street. Um, this is a uh, continuation of sorts um, from what we started along the banks of Allendale Woods um, several years ago um, to the private property at Sophia Snow Place. So we are proposing um, management of invasive understory shrubs and trees in this particular location, again, from that, uh, from that outlet. Um, there it's you know dominated with these species as, as you can see here a lot of uh, bittersweet in this particular area as well as burning bush small patches of excuse me Japanese knotweed as well as honeysuckle uh, multiflora rose um, and and other species so there is a um, fairly like dominant invasive uh, orver story that we're looking to open up to create more diversity, both in the, not only the canopy layer, 
with natives, but also in the shrub layer and also the ground layer. Uh, next slide, please. So this would be the proposed uh, planting plan. You can see the steep slopes of this outlet um, swale that goes down to the culvert on Center Street. Um, so we're uh, in the process of looking at, um, you know, larger trees, shrubs, and, um, and also seeding and live staking uh, down into the, uh, into the outlet. Next slide, please which is a cross section, um, just looking through the ravine. I mean, this is, you know, showing still a, a canopy layer as well as a shrub layer on these particular banks. In the center there, you can see that outlet swale that we're looking at as a wet meadow plant community. You know, everything from herbaceous species like sensitive fern and swan milkweeds, um, you know, blue vervains and blue flags, joe pie, et cetera like with a more um, open, some more open sunlight in there. Coming up on the banks is more of a uh, scrub shrub wetland on both sides of the bank up to a more um, upland buffer with trees and shrubs. Next slide, please. So this is a description specifically of the trees that we're proposing planting. Um, this is up on the, on the left-hand slide I'm sorry, on the left hand side of the left slide, <laughs> you can see that um, there are a lot of the property line is right there. So we are proposing uh, planting, you know, um, trees on that particular edge, also wrapping around the nose um, of that out outlet swale closest to Center Street. And then as you go up the hill, um, other clusters of, of uh, native shrubs. Um, currently, we have 27 trees proposed with pretty high diversity, as you can see in the right hand um, right hand slide. Next slide. This is a shrub layer. There's a total of 258 shrubs that we've proposed. Um, again, a lot of diversity here. Everything from uh, wetland down along the edges of the outlet swale to more of upland species along the top of the bank. And next slide, please. And then we're also looking at um, planting plugs and containers, this and live staking, showing on, this is more in that, um, in that, lower, that lower swale area, a combination of a lot of diversity associated with both. The, um, the seeding would also, and plugs would be done on the banks themselves. Um, going down to the swale, and then we would have um, the live staking that would be, you know, taking place later in the season, most likely in November uh, to December of this season or early next year in the, you know, up until around March, the live staking would occur to get such species as like the button bush and, and dogwoods, willows, and elderberry. Um, so with that, I open to any questions that the commission may have. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. I uh, just want to make note. Um, uh, I liked your analogy of the savings accounts, uh, but in lieu of the Silicon Valley Bank uh, meltdown, you might want to put that one on the shelf for a little while, reintroduce it in a year or two. Um, anyway, I um, want to remind members of the public uh, to provide public comment. Please raise your hand or type in the chat in the application via the Zoom meeting platform. If you're calling in and cannot use the platform, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine and star six to unmute yourself. Send your questions to staff via email at cc at boston.gov or via Twitter by tagging the Twitter handle at Boston Enviro and using the hashtag concom hearing. Allison, do you have anything on this? Uh, just a question. How long do you expect this work to take and when do you plan to start it? Uh, Miles, do you want to give an idea of what your time frame is? So when you're looking at something like the Japanese knotweed, um, you know, I would say that it's probably upwards of three years. This is at a time when, you know, you're really targeting um, the, the, um, the management methods. You know, with approval from the commission, we'd like to start this season. Um, that would that would include um, initial initial like invasive management through the area, through the through the course of the season, um, and then into in, into this fall, um, really start to do a lot of the uh, planting um, once invasive plants have been removed. 
we would bet we would also continue to be on site um, working with Sophia Snowplace to make sure that we are maintaining and stewarding um, the property into um, you know into a stable state. Um, so that is really we're looking at most likely I would say probably like three years of actually being on site at appropriate times. But, but if I can just ask you to clarify, when would you expect all the plantings would be in and the, the initial rounds of invasive work done? We would start with the uh, planting of the tree species. Uh, I would suspect that that could be done in the late summer, early fall of this season. Um, and then we could even follow up with some of the shrubs at that time as well. So the woody plant material. And I would say in the spring of next year, we would probably post vernal pool activity. So probably late June, you know, into early July, start to work in some of the perennial layers. All right. Thanks. And you got, yeah, the reference to the, the vernal pool condition. Right. And if I can, if I can add one thing that I forgot to mention, DEP did issue some comments and they suggested conditioning that the work not occur during the active vernal pool area. And they suggested uh, summer and fall be the appropriate times for the work, which, which we're fine with. Um, the one thing we would like to be able to do by hand is trim the knotweed down so that we're treating active regrowth later. And that could all be done by hand with no power tools. Um, uh, we would like to still be able to do that just very carefully um, with a very small footprint. Uh, you know, just a, a couple guys going down there and doing a little bit of cutting. But uh, with that, we do want to be sensitive to the vernal pool and the vernal pool habitat and the critters that like to be in that area. Thank you. Chair? Great. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? How many uh, solitude peers, if that's what you decide to do, are required in order to support that uh, bridge? So uh, my best guess right now, and, I, and, and this is one of the things that we need to, um, we need to make sure we've got right. Um, if we look at the plan, I think the engineer may have shown that if we could go back through the presentation to that slide. But if not, I think it would be four. Um, no, he does not show, but I think I think we'd be looking at four. The, the ends would essentially rest um, with the granite on the ground. I don't think we would need anything there, but we get up so that the, um, the surface of the walkway is almost three feet above the path in the center in order to get that pitch. So we really need to support the middle. So I would in picture, I would picture sort of two about a third of the way and another two um, at the at the final point there. Yeah, and so uh, Allison, I just suggest that they have a stamped plan by an engineer of how this walkway is supported, uh, how many they need. And, uh, you know, they said there may be an alternative, but we don't know what that is. We don't know what kind of work needs to be done, what kind of equipment needs to be brought in there. Um, it's kind of open to me. The, um, the, the other question I had is the outlet from this vernal pool area that goes into the pipe culvert that goes to Center Street. Is that clear now? And uh, do you plan on doing any work in that vicinity to make sure that if it is partially blocked by either stones or trees or whatever, so you have to clean that up? We're, we're certainly willing to. Um, when I was last there, there was no significant obstruction, but I don't think the pipe, I think the pipe may be partially buried at the bottom, you know, third of it or, or third to a half. And so the question is, I, I would not want to get into digging the stream, what's formed a stream bed up, but certainly removing any kind of woody debris and we could work with you um, and your staff on any, uh, any recommendations and work with the commission uh, while we're in there on making any improvements that, that allow that to function better. But I'd be hesitant to dig down into the channel because then we could get head cut erosion working its way back towards the vernal pool. Oh, yeah, I understand that. I'm just asking the question whether you guys had come up with a decision. And the question always comes yeah. up, who, who owns that area? You know, who's, who's got responsibility to make sure it drains? Um, and I'm not sure who that answer is. That land, I assume, is owned by Sophia Longhouse. Is that, is that their backyard? 
Yeah, that they they purchased it after the uh, unsuccessful development right. attempt there. Um, and you know, certainly, I would envision that that you know, as part of just general maintenance, if they see that you know there's brush and debris that are over it, um, that can be easily cleaned up. They could they could be doing that. And if it was something bigger, they could coordinate with uh, with conservation and the city on how to, you know, how to approach it if they notice something, um, you know, certainly with this and then with phase two, there'll be more regular eyes on that area than, right. than in the past. And, and so, Allison, I just think about whether or not there should be a perpetual maintenance uh, condition where they notify staff that there's after a storm, after whatever, there's something potentially blocking it. That being blocked, it simply floods them and no one else. It just floods the uh, upland. So that's just a thought. Thank you. That's and all I got. Do oh, we right. have, if, if you'd permit, do we have information, Tom, on on the construction methodology? As yeah, that typically, um, if it's sauna tubes, it's going to be um, a small mini going in with an auger and uh, and augering down for the for the sauna tubes. Um, we would be using a bobcat, I would imagine, for the and or, or possibly some work by hand for the, uh, the stone dust at either end. But it would be fairly small equipment, um, and uh, and then the uh, if it's if it's diamond piers, it's essentially picture a cinder block with three holes in it. That's basically folks with a sledgehammer um, installing those. Um, but we'll need some small equipment to kind of do the do the the two ends um, and we'll have erosion control in place. There's nothing, there's no significant excavation needed for, for, you know, we're, we're essentially evaluating iterations of what you see for a plan in front of you. And, and, uh, and what we need to do is actually get more of a framing plan for it and evaluate whether or not we could use the, uh, the diamond piers, which are a must, basically there's no soil disturbance whatsoever with those. And that's our preference. But I wanted to show the sauna tubes because it, it's much easier to come back to you with a plan change that removes sauna tubes than if we find out we can't use diamond piers, um, you know, and then have to come back and say we've got something that we have to do is more aggressive. Um, so what I would ask on that would just be that, you know, we have to give you a final plan for approval uh, for the walkway improvements. And that will also give us time, um, you know, to, to get the the bids on it and, and the the um, you know the the final sort of construction design of it and and in that process coordinate with parks because again this is the the entry to to Allendale and make sure that everybody likes how we're going forward with it and uh, and that it's consistent with what we're asking you to approve tonight. Okay, uh, Commissioner Sullivan, are you done? No, I gave up a couple of minutes ago. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Long, what do you have? First off, uh, wanting to thank Snow Place for all the work with Urban Wilds um, and uh, as well as Parterre. So, I, you know, this is a great project that complements the work that Parks is doing. Um, it's in line with uh, what Paul and the Urban Wilds team is working on. Um, and I know, I know you have a plan for this in place. I just didn't see it in the documents that were submitted. Um, how will you uh, ensure the success of the plantings uh, after two growing seasons, especially so, in the case of a drought? Right. So, so um, as as Miles mentioned, they're going to be there, um, sort of fostering the growth for the first. Uh, two to three growing seasons. And uh, we would certainly expect, and I believe in the draft order, there are monitoring conditions with reports to be submitted. Um, and typically, you know, this is a fairly generic answer, but I think it's a good answer, which is typically, you know, we put in these plants uh, with the best science and intentions behind what we put in, but that sometimes we put them in and we find that one species struggles and doesn't do well. And so if that happens, if it's a species-wide issue, we swap out the species with another approved native, either something already on the list 
or we go back to to concom and say can we substitute this if it's just a single plant that has mortality because it frost heaves out of the ground or something like that then we just replace it with the same um so it's a matter of, of proper monitoring um and proper follow-up and the one thing i really like about parterre is is they're not a landscape firm that just runs in pops plants in the ground and throws down mulch and then drives away um, they're going to follow up on this and be on top of it and we would expect both the contractor selection the folks who are doing the work but also the um the conditions in the order would be uh supportive of of requiring that kind of approach excellent thank you tom um that that's the only question i had great thank you commissioner herbs um just a couple of questions one is i i see a number of property lines running through here is is all the work on your property yes um, okay yeah and there are there are is a cr on the um a portion of the the trail i believe got it and i i have been i thought on all the trails uh in allendale woods um is this now or intended to be a public access place so, and, so, and does it let me just and yeah it, it doesn't show this map on the allendale woods map it doesn't i'm not clear does it connect to a path that goes further into the woods um and actually patty's with us tonight i'll, I'll let her answer that because i've only walked in there a little bit and i wasn't aware it wasn't on the allendale map um but what I will say is right now it mainly serves as an access point to and from Sophia Snow Place. And our phase two application, which I think is going for a final council vote tomorrow with uh with uh public funds is um the community uh preservation act funds is um I think that vote is tomorrow, but that will actually take this path and extend it at an accessible grade all the way down to this um, healing garden that we're looking to install right at Center Street. So we will actually have a publicly accessible trailhead. There'll be an extension of a CR as part of that process. Um, so when we're done, not just this phase, but the next phase, um, Allendale Woods will be accessible to the public from Center Street. And, and I want to make clear, this is Patty Rogovine, um, I'm president and CEO at, at Sophia Snow Place. What we're trying to do here is create an, you know, an accessible path for mobility challenged and other disabilities into the, um, into the green areas, um, you know, both on our own private property, but also Allendale Woods as far as we can. Um, that path goes directly to Springhouse, but it uh, also, you know, goes off in different directions. Um, and I know a number of our residents who can do the walk have, mat have made it um, into other sections of Allendale Woods as have a high. So yes, it does connect um, um, <laughs> and it's, um, it's not the most, it's not the one that's most used, but it is, uh, we hope, going to be the most used by those folks that are not typically able to enter um, the area because of their own challenges with respect to mobility, eyesight, and other issues. Uh, thank you for that. And, and maybe it's just a question actually for Commissioner Long. I, I was wondering about it becoming a busy path near the vernal pool, but it sounds like this is something that you're working on with them together. So not a cause for concern. No, and um, it, I don't think it's on the trail map probably because of when the capital project happened for Allendale Woods. Um, it probably was at a different stage than the capital projects. And Allendale Woods, you might know, is yeah, that smattering of conservation commission owned land and then the private CRs. So it's really a patchwork. Okay, thanks. So no more questions for me. Okay. And Commissioner Herbs is part of the CPA grant on that committee, as you know. Um, so we we're happy to award for the phase two um, of this project. And there is a um, time limit. Uh, the money has to be used fairly quickly. So I would expect to see phase two um, come imminently after this. Sure. Um, okay. Um, one question I did have, last time I was over there, um, I did run into a rather large um, dumpster farm. Um, and I don't remember if it was the Sophia Snow property or another property. Is that your property that 
as I seem to remember like eight or 10 dumpsters out there. We had a uh, project of, uh, over the winter for about eight or nine months uh, where we replaced the entire HVAC system in the building to mm -hmm. become in compliance with uh, Boston standards uh, for 2025. And so those are now gone. Thank goodness okay. the project's over. But yeah, that's what that was about. Okay, understood. Thank you. Okay, uh, Allison, anyone from the public? Yes, we have two hands raised. The first is Yvonne. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for taking my testimony. Um, I had a question that I put in the chat. Uh, how many trees, how many mature trees are planning to be removed? Oh, quote unquote removed because they're going to be killed. Uh, you don't remove trees, you kill them. Uh, trees are not things, they are living beings. And when you remove them, you remove the wildlife that is in them. And that's essentially what you will be doing by removing trees. I would add, I want to recommend that instead of making plans for paths that are straight and that cut into the area that trees cover, that you go around the trees. I don't know why you ever, you always have to do, well, you, I mean, in general, generally, in improvement projects always involve uh, straight lines. Um, and, and that in, in its essence ignores the uh, nature of nature. Nature is not in straight lines, it's fractal. And uh, if we want to um, improve nature, then we should go along with it and not disturb it. Um, my second- Yvonne, let's, let's let them answer your first question about the trees and then let's get to your second question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to look at the image behind me. That is not a straight path, and that's the kind of thing I like to do. So your your comment is well noted. Um, we um, we are not changing the footprint of an ex there's an existing path. We're just looking at changing the slope of it. So we will not be impacting any trees with that path work. The oh. tree removal that we're talking about is entirely re related to invasive species control and invasive species removal we are trying to leave some trees in place as snags which means they will be dead but standing and they will remain uh, as habitat while we replace them with uh, native species that will be more resilient um, and that will not have a liliopathic properties uh, as many of the invasive trees do and those properties essentially prevent the growth of an understory and if you look in that area, all we have are invasive understory. There's a couple of skunk cabbage, but other than that, there's not much herbaceous plants. And we'll be able to establish a population of ferns and other, um, other herbaceous plants, a better shrub layer, and a more diverse tree layer. So while there will be you know, killing of, of Norway maples and there's a, a large cork tree, um, those are very aggressive, invasive plants that prevent growth of a diverse, uh, you know, sort of, they, they prevent the area from being as biodiverse as, as I think the vernal pool deserves to have in its buffer. So what we are trying to do is improve habitat. Um, we are not removing trees for any benefit in terms of a development or anything like that. We're trying to actually recover the ecology of the area, and that's the whole purpose of the project. Great, thank you. Uh, Yvonne, what was your second question? Oh, my second question was, um, oh God, I had it here. Uh, yes, um, gosh. Um, uh, so, uh, oh yes, this idea that uh, when you plant new trees, you're into the savings of an account or something. I heard that uh, that metaphor mentioned uh, that is in savings, but I want to remind these uh, architects that, you know, if you invest in the stock market, the stock market and the stock market fails uh, and drops and uh, crashes, then you lose all your savings. And this is the situation in which we are right now. Our environment is changing and becoming, uh, a, in, you know, we have global warming and we have climate change accosting us is happening faster than we can think of 
to plant new trees, thinking that they're going to survive uh, and replace old trees is a, uh, it's a chimera. I don't know how to say it in English. No, that it's was a, good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Understood. Yeah, please, that was perfect. You know, start thinking about that way. And I'm, I'm very much against, uh, you know, calling trees, any kind of trees, invasive. That's nature. And um, we should just walk around, work around them. They are, they are part of our environment. And uh, to, re to cut an, an immature tree to release carbon into the air is a, a, a death sentence to us and to our future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Yvonne, I just want to explain um, the um, eradication of invasives. Invasives, um, they uh, squeeze out wetlands. They're actually bad for wetlands resource areas. So there's there's definitely a um, trade-off there and a dilemma. So, but thank you for your comments. Um, who else do we have? We can have I, George if, Marsh. Oh, Patty. Yeah, can I just sure. add to Yvonne? I'm, I'm really excited that you might attend when we do this kind of hearing for phase two. We're transferring what was a, 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 a gas station lot into um, a, a climate sensitive um, area that's going to actually contribute um, more than take away. And um, I think that your, you know, your, your, your feelings are feelings we share. Uh, we do want to handle the invasives, but when we come back with phase two of this, you'll see that we'll be planting numbers of trees, removing nothing and adding um, only positives to, you know, what we consider to be climate sensitive, um, you know, uh, uh, strategies. So uh, again, we'll hope, hopefully have you um, at that, you know, next time phase two, and we'll all be on the same page. Thank you, Patty. Uh, I think we're moving on to George. Yes, hello again. Um, I'm probably more familiar with this particular property and specifically the outlet of the Vernal Pool than probably anyone else on this call, Tom Hughes included. Uh, I live in the neighborhood. Uh, my uh, former mother-in-law was a longtime resident of Sophia Snow Place. I have done volunteer work over there, landscaping work. I have um, I know Paul. Um, and I'm familiar with Parterre's previous work, uh, restoring around the Vernal Pool, which I am very complimentary of and um, want to give them kudos for that. So, and I've met several of their workers in the past, um, and I've seen the work that they've done around the Rosendale Wetlands. I believe that's them as well. And so I'm very familiar with their work and, and certainly supportive of their, their expertise. My concerns um, are also along the lines of Yvonne just expressed by cutting very mature trees. I mean, there are some very huge, uh, they're non-native trees on this parcel, which I've been aware of for at least the last 15 years. Um, they haven't been managed by either of the land, the previous landowners on either side of the brook. And, uh, but they do provide a very substantial tree shade canopy uh, which helps cool the the, wa the outlet waters from the vernal pool, also helps cool the water in the vernal pool, which is a, a very much uh, beneficial aspect. And once these trees are killed, removed, they are going to allow in a lot more sunlight that's going to warm up the, the water in the vernal pool as well as the outlet stream. And I think that's an issue that the commission should consider in its deliberations. And I haven't heard anyone of the pro proponents talking about these these this aspect there was a lot of a focus in this hearing just now on the the uh, improvement to the trail section which I'm also very familiar with uh, but that is much further away from the vernal pool uh, I, I think the impacts of that are insignificant compared to what's going to happen when these trees are removed uh, along the outlet stream and I also am very familiar with the trail system all all throughout Allendale Woods as well as uh, coming in from the uh, Sophia Snow property and that trail that they are intending to improve. And I'm certainly an applaud of their efforts to do that in the future, um, opening up access from Center Street to the public. Uh, that trail is going goes from Sophia Snow Place directly to the edge of the Springhouse Senior Development up above on the hill. There is no 
direct access or existing improved trail to the Allender Woods itself from that property. So I think it's a little disingenuous to be talking about improving access when in fact there is not uh, accessible access currently onto Allendale Woods from that trail. It goes directly from Sophia Snow Place private property to the Spring House private property. So I think the commission needs to be aware of that. And, you know, I know the situation back there. Like I said, I've been going back there now for 15 years. Um, and, you know, I'm very familiar with the everything that's going on on the ground with previous um, uh, director of Sophia Snow Place. I know Patty personally as well. She knows me. I've offered to uh, meet with her and uh, her consultants about the tree work. Uh, that never happened. And so, and I've just read the report. I've just no read the notice of intent very carefully, as well as Parterre's proposal. And I still have some concerns and questions about some of the details of it. Thank you. Hey, thank you, George. Um, Tom, did you want to briefly speak to the um, impacts of the tree removal on the uh, Vernal Pool? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you look at what we've proposed for, for replanting, we're using two-inch caliper trees, which um, and we're using a significant number of them. So uh, along with the, the shrub layer that we'd be putting in, we'll be uh, providing uh, equivalent, if not uh, denser canopy pretty quickly. The, um, there will certainly be a loss of canopy with the larger invasive trees. Um, one of the things with Norway's is they have such a, a dense invade, you know, dense uh, leaf layer and they leaf out early is that they shade out and block the growth of a lot of native uh, understory plants. So um, the one benefit because we're at the outlet area is the effects of the loss of canopy are going to be more felt on the um, on the stream that's flowing away from the vernal pool than on the vernal pool itself. Um, the vernal pool itself has some fringe canopy along the edge um, and the the catchment, the watershed that flows into the vernal pool has a has a fairly dense canopy and we're not touching uh, the areas that are that are flowing into it. So, you know, it, we're cognizant of that concern and we've tried to be careful in how we've designed this to try to have, uh, you know, really minimize any adverse effects and really maximize the biodiversity of what we're putting in there and the quantity of the trees and all that and overall um, create an improvement in the ecology of the area and an improvement in the um, ecology and the, and the vernal pool habitat of this section. Um, so that's okay. Thank you, Tom. Uh, anyone else, Allison? I'm not seeing any other hands. Okay. So with that, I would uh, entertain a motion to close the hearing uh, with the addition of a special condition to the order of conditions regarding uh, requirements, stamp plans, and the final um, method of construction of the um, of the path. I guess we're talking about sauna tubes versus diamond piers. Yeah. Do I have that motion? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Thank you. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. That carries four nothing. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, you're welcome. See you at phase two. Uh, there have also been a number of continuances continued to the April 19th hearing as notice of intent for DEP file number 0061772 and Boston file number 2021-010. Notice continued, uh, notice of intent for DEP file number 0061704 and Boston file number 2020-007. Notice of intent for DEP file number 0061820 and Boston file number 2021-045. Also continued is a um, request for a determination of applicability uh, regarding the property located at 2 Starling and 34 and 36 Willett Streets in West Roxbury. We have a uh, commission will now begin its regular meeting. We have a number of uh, continuances there as well. Continued has been a request for a certificate of compliance uh, for DEP file number 00601, no, yeah, 006-1613, uh, request for... Um, I think yep. 006 
uh, 1613 is not a continuance. The other three are. Okay. I think. Um, so, so for that one, staff uh, performed a site visit on Wednesday, April 5th, 2023. The site was clear and all conditions appeared to have been met. Staff recommend issuing the certificate of compliance. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'd uh, entertain a motion to issue a certificate of compliance for DEB file number 006-16130. So moved. We have a second. Second. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. Uh, so Allison, I have three more. They're all continued? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, continued is a request for a certificate of compliance for DEP file number 006158. Uh, DEP file number 0061867 and Boston file number 2022-026 and DEP file number uh, 006-1855 and Boston file number 2022-017. Um, next item on the agenda are, are administrative updates. Uh, no updates other than the vote that is next on the hearing. Fantastic. Okay. I have next item on the agenda is acceptance of the following orders of conditions. It is upcoming on the hearing, excuse me. Upcoming, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, let me look over these real quickly. I don't think we have any recusals. No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. So um, I would entertain a motion to accept the following orders of conditions. Notice of intent for DEP file number 0061891 and Boston file 2022-046. DEP file number 0061923 and Boston file number 2023-010. Um, and DEP file number 0061922 and Boston file number 2023-015. Do I have that motion? So moved. Mm -hmm. Second. Great. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. I vote aye. It carries four nothing. Okay. Next item on the agenda is discussion and vote to designate uh, Elena. And um, the name is um, uh, obscured on my copy here. So I apologize. Um, uh, Elena Itamiri. Okay. Thank you. Elena Intamary, uh, as the commission's agent. Uh, any any flavor to this, Allison, other than a big sigh of relief? Well, I am very pleased uh, to note that this is both Elena's first hearing and first day uh, <laughs> with the city. Uh, she was recently hired in the Environment Department as the executive director and uh, would uh, recommend that the commission designate her as the agent. Fantastic. Any questions from any of the commissioners? Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm happy to great. be here. Absolutely. That's great. Uh, happy to have you. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion to appoint uh, Elena Itamari as the commission's agent. So moved. We have a second. Seconded. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. Carries three nothing. Welcome and thank you. Um, last item on the agenda is acceptance of meeting minutes from March 15th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Okay. Commissioner Sullivan? Aye. Commissioner Long? Aye. Commissioner Herbst? Aye. And I vote aye. Um, great. Uh, motion to adjourn by acclamation. Actually, I should say before we go, Allison, uh, thank you so much. I know we're still going to be seeing you, but um, everything you did was so far above and beyond uh, the call of duty. And I know you work three or four jobs and you must be exhausted and um, catch up on some rest and uh, we'll see you soon. Uh, thank thank you. you very much, Chair. I really appreciate all of your the commission's help uh, during this time as well. Great. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to adjourn? Any objections? None. Okay. Great. No. Thank you. Good night. See you in a few. Thank night you. all. Good night all. Good night.